morning, everyone. I understand that the state law currently requires that the following announcement be made at the beginning of every remote public hearing as follows. Due to the current public health emergency, city council committees are currently meeting remotely. We are using Microsoft Teams to make these remote hearings possible. Instructions for how the public may view and offer public testimony at public hearings of council committees are included in the public hearings. Notices that are published in the Daily News, Enquirer, and Legal Intelligence prior to the hearings and can also be found on phlcouncil.com. Will the clerk please call roll to take attendance? Members that are in attendance will please indicate they are present when their names are called. Also, please say a few brief words when responding so that your image will be displayed on screen when you speak. Council member Mark Squilla. Good morning, uh, Mr. Chair. Present. Council Member Maria Canona Sanchez. Good morning, Council Chair and uh, members. Council Member Cindy Bass. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, colleagues, and uh, all in attendance for today's hearing. Good morning. Council Member David O. Good morning, Chair. Good morning, colleagues. Councilmember Catherine Gilmore Richardson. Good morning, Mr. Chair. Good morning, colleagues. Thank you very, very much. Councilmember Brian O'Neill. Good morning, everyone. And also present, uh, Councilmember Jamie. Gall Good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, and to the public present. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Brett. Um, a quorum of the committee is present, and this hearing is now called to order. This is a public hearing of the Committee on Rules regarding bills number 210549, 210634, 210637, 210638, 210667, 210668. 210686, 210687, 210741, 210742, 210778, and 210808. Very full schedule today. Will the clerk please read the titles of the bills? Bill number 210638. A bill to amend the Philadelphia zoning maps by changing the zoning designations of certain areas of land located within an area bounded by 11th Street, Reed Street, 12th Street, and Wharton Street. To amend Title 14 by adding the South Philadelphia Municipal Hub Overlay District and making other related changes and improving the Residential Mixed Use District Master Plan. For the site generally bounded by 11th Street, Reed Street, 12th Street, and Wharton Street all under certain terms and conditions. Bill number 210637, amending Title 14 of the Philadelphia Code entitled Zoning and Planning by amending certain provisions of Chapter 14-800, titled Parking and Loading, pertaining to parking requirements for uses in historically designated properties, all under term, certain terms and conditions. Bill number 210686, to amend the Philadelphia zoning maps by changing the zoning designations of certain areas of land located within an area bounded by Walnut Street, 9th Street, Locust Street, and 10th Street. Bill number 210687 to amend the Philadelphia zoning maps by changing the zoning designation of er certain areas of land located within an area bounded by Trenton Avenue, Cambria Street, Tulip Street, and William Street. Bill number 210549 approving an amendment to the Articles of Incorporation of the City Avenue Special Service Di Services District of Philadelphia and Lower Marion. To extend the term of the existence of the district to December 31st, 2042. Bill number 210667, amending Title 14 529 of the Philadelphia Code, entitled Fifth District Overlay District, to prohibit certain bonuses all under certain terms and conditions. Bill number 210668. 
amending section 14-504 of the Philadelphia Code entitled Neighborhood Conservation Overlay Districts. By expanding the existing Strawberry Mansion NCO area to include the area bounded by Lehigh Avenue, 29th Street, and Sedgley Avenue under certain terms and conditions. Bill number 210741 to amend the Philadelphia zoning maps by changing the zoning designations of certain areas of land located within an area bounded by 20th Street, Arch Street, Cuthbert Street, and 21st Street, all under certain terms and conditions. Bill number 210742, amending section 14-502 of the Philadelphia Code, entitled Center City Overlay District, by amending certain height regulations and creating bulk and massing controls within the Benjamin Franklin Parkway area under certain terms and conditions. Bill number 210808, to amend the Philadelphia zoning maps by changing the zoning designations of certain areas of land located within an area bound by Oxford Avenue, Shellmeyer Avenue, Rising Sun Avenue, Solly Avenue, the County Line, Warbeck Avenue, Hast Bill number 210634 to amend the master plan for the University of Philadelphia by areas of land located within an area bounded by Guardian Drive, East Service Drive, Civic Center Boulevard, 34th Street and 33rd Street, and Walnut Street and the Schuylkill River. 34th Street and University Avenue. And Bill 210778, to amend Title 14 of the Philadelphia Code by adding Section 14 530, Affordable Housing Prevention Overlay District, and making other. Good related morning. This is a message from the Philadelphia Department of Public Health. Would someone please mute the microphone? <laughs> and vaccine boosters or third doses have been recommended for individuals 18 years of age and older. Uh, and everyone, if you're not speaking, please put your camera on mute. Thank you. To amend the Philadelphia zoning maps by changing the zoning designation of certain areas of land located within an area bounded by 39th Street, Ludlow Street, 40th Street, and Market Street, and to establish a temporary demolition moratorium within the respect with, with respect to properties within the aforementioned area, all under certain terms and conditions. Thank you very much, Brett. Before we begin to hear testimony from the witnesses we have for today, everyone who has been invited to the meeting to testify should be aware that this public hearing is being recorded. Because the hearing is public, participants and viewers have no reasonable expectation of privacy. By continuing to be in the meeting, you are consenting to being recorded. Additionally, prior to recognizing members for the questions or comments they have for witnesses, I will note for the record at this time that we will use the chat feature available on Microsoft Teams to allow members to signify that they wish to be recognized. In order to comply with the Sunshine Act, the chat feature must only be used for this purpose. Before we begin, please let the record reflect that Bill number 210741 is being held at the request of the sponsor and will be heard at a later date. Would the clerk please call the panel? For the f one second. Hey, Brett, is there another bill that we want to hold as well? There will be another bill that is held, but we are hearing it today. Okay, so we all right. Thank you. So we're going to move forward with what we have right now. Yes. Will the clerk please call the panel for bill number 210638? We have Paula Brumblow Burns and Thomas Dalfo. Will you state your name for the record and please begin your testimony? Uh, good morning, members of the Rules Committee. I am Paula Brumbelow Burns, Director of Legislation for the Philadelphia City Planning Commission. I'm here to testify on Bill Number 210638, which was introduced into City Council on June 24th, 2021, by Council Member Squilla. Bill Number 210638 amends Title 14 of the Philadelphia Zoning Code, entitled Zoning and Planning to revise certain provisions of Chapter 14-500 entitled Overlay Zoning Districts by adding the Section 14-531 entitled SMH, South Philadelphia Municipal Hub Overlay District, and approving the Residential Mixed Use 2 District, RMX2, Master Plan for the site. The proposed bill will remap the site to RMX2, which is a Master Plan District, along with the attached Master Plan. 
the SMH overlay requires affordable dwelling units and green roofs for any new residential development on the site, changes open air requirements and curb cut size restrictions, as well as allowances for commercial square footage in the RMX2 district. The development team and development plan for the municipal complex site was selected through an RFP process led by PIDC with significant community engagement and the general features of the proposed master plan are consistent with the recommendations of the South District Plan. The Philadelphia City Planning Commission considered Bill number 210638 at its meeting of October 26, 2021 and recommended for approval. I will be happy to answer any questions at this time. Will the clerk please call the next panelist? Is Thomas Dolfo in the... Thomas Dolfo. I am. Uh, good morning. Can everyone hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Thomas. Great. Thank you. Uh, good morning. My name is Thomas Dalfo. I'm Senior Vice President for Real Estate Services at the Philadelphia Industrial Development Corporation, or PIDC. Uh, PIDC uh, managed the developer selection process for the property in question related to this bill, and I'm testifying support of the ordinance that's been introduced. Real briefly, let me just give background on the timeline for the process because it was quite extensive for this site. Uh, PIDC, uh, at the city's request, drafted and then issued a request for proposals for developers in, on October 17, 2018. In November 6, 2018, I presented to the Passyunk Square Civic Association at their general meeting regarding the RFP process. In November 14th, 2018, uh, PIDC managed a, a tour of the fleet management facility, the largest facility in this, uh, in this asset. Um, and then in January 18th, we ex um, had a proposed deadline uh, for the, um, the development um, responses. And that deadline was, uh, was extended somewhat in response to community concerns and requests for um, to incorporation of affordable housing into the project. So we afforded the development community additional time to provide a response uh, based on that. In April, uh, April 10th of 2019, uh, PIDC hosted a series of um, uh, interviews with shortlisted developers um, on their proposals for the project. And I would note that the Passyunk Square Civic Association had one member on the selection committee um, and had three members uh, of their planning team um, in uh, in attendance uh, in those, um, those developer interviews and presentations. On October 4th, 2019, the selection committee uh, made a recommendation to select uh, Altera Property Group as the developer for the site. December 16th, 2019, uh, there was a community meeting with the city, PIDC, and Altera Property Group, um, coordinated by the Passyunk Square Civic Association. Um, in July, uh, then we hit a bit of a hiatus with the pandemic. Uh, and earlier this year, in July, July 20th, 2021, um, there was another Passyunk Square Civic, Civic Association meeting focusing on the redevelopment process for the site and the planning, and PIDC participated in that. In August of this year, there was a, the, the RCO meeting that was required under the zoning code was held, um, and uh, just uh, a, a couple a week or so ago, there was a another meeting with the Passyunk Square Civic Association addressing some community questions regarding the fire station. Um, that extends my that ends my testimony. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. The chair will now recognize um, Councilor Mark Squella uh, to make any remarks regarding this particular bill. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you, uh, Paula and uh, Tom, for your uh, testimony. Um, Tom, real quick, and I know we um, this has been a long process uh, from the uh, fall of 18, uh, but um, this is something new that we have done, at least in my district, where we have engaged uh, the community to be part of the uh, selection process. Normally, the council person gets a, a seat at the uh, at that table when uh, the selection process was done. Um, real 
real quick, uh, Passion Square uh, was at the selection process and also inputted it into the RFP, especially with the concern with the affordability process. Um, have you? Has it been done before where the uh, community group has been a part of the selection process in as far as one of the RFPs that PIDC has done previously? Um, uh, Councilman, not to this extent. The the level of coordination and, and involvement that we've had with the Passing Square Civic Association really represents the the, the most intensive amount of community uh, coordination, uh, and I think uh, to good effect. Uh, I think the the project here uh, has been uh, has been before the community a number of times, and we were able to adjust. Um, the requirements of the RFP with input from the community. So uh, to answer your question, no, this is the most extensive that we've had. All right, and I, I just wanted to reiterate that point too, because you know sometimes things take longer uh, when we have a lot of concerns and questions from the community during the process. But I, what I think came out of this was changes in the development uh, that we saw through that process, uh, the process of selecting a developer depending on what proposals were given forth and the RFP sort of um, changed also because of the concerns from the community. Uh, we also looked at this as far as remapping and planning suggestion for what zoning to uh, make this process work and you know there's been questions all along and community concerns and there still are and you know we still have time to work with the developer on this project uh, for uh, concerns from the community. But uh, I just want to thank PIDC and the Planning Commission because it's a lot more work. It took a lot more time. Uh, you know, we, we, we did this during challenging times also, but even the uh, process of the RCO flyering the community to do in-person meetings, but then doing the virtual meetings. <coughs> where you have many people on uh, to, to discuss, discuss their concerns. And we have people on both sides of this, right? We have people who said, it was uh, too dense of a project. We people said it wasn't enough density. We have people said it's too much parking. We have people said it wasn't enough parking. And the, the project kept evolving until we got to a point uh, where we are now at, where we're introducing an ordinance uh, for a remapping of this whole entire area. <clears throat> but there's still more processes to go. There's a master plan process. And maybe, Paula, can you explain how the master plan process uh, works? as we attach it to this ordinance? Yes, once the plan is attached to the ordinance, that is the approved plan. So if they ever want to amend it by building a building larger, uh, they will have to come back through city council to have that plan amended. So there will always be, if they want to go basically deviate from what they've proposed, they will always have to come back through the public process to create any amendments to the plan. So right. it gives more security to the neighborhood. Right, and I wanna say that because we, we have actually did a remapping of an area on a previous project in um, Pashunk Square, and we were sort of burnt on that project where a developer came back and because we remapped something, they were able to come back and build a more dense, more height of a building. This allows us to have know exactly what we supported as a community and then knowing that the developer can't come back later and says oh well the zoning allows us to do this therefore we have it already and we're going to continue that so I think this protection is very important uh, for the community adding the master plan to uh, the ordinance and then the master plan also has to be approved by the Planning Commission correct you guys are now going to go through that process to approve the master plan um, we we have approved our portion of it, but it will, and so it is now up to City Council to to finalize the approval of the master plan. All right, so that that'll be done with this process. Yes, and uh, making sure they're done at the same time. Now, after this process is done and we remap the area, there will then be another process for the city to sell the property. And uh, does planning work with public property on the sale? Because during the RFP process, uh, a, um, a, a point of the RFP was that any project here would have to have an uh, EOP attached to the sale of this property. Um, 
So as the sale is being done, public property works with planning, and then we'll be introducing an ordinance to sell that property. Is that correct? Yes. And so the planning commission will then vote on it, and then it will go to the public properties committee. So that'll come to the public properties committee, yes. and then at that committee, there'll be a, another public hearing where the community could weigh in. And all during this process, we will be able to work with the developer on, you know, concerns, still concerns that people may have and how we could address those concerns uh, as this whole plan is finalized. Uh, so I just want to, again, thank both planning and PIDC. I know it's been a long, drooling process, and I know that, you know, it's still a lot more work to do. But I think that by doing this and having the involvement in the community ahead of time, it'll allow us to, to move forward and continue to address concerns as we hear them from our our neighbors and uh, and folks close by. So thank you for uh, that and uh, looking forward to continue working with you on this project. Thank you very much, Council Squilla. Any other questions or comments from members of the committee on this particular bill? Okay, hearing none. Councilman School, I have one small question. I think it's a great project. I'm in that area pretty frequently. Um, where is the fire station going to go? The fire station that is currently at 12th and Reed will be rebuilt on 11th Street side of the project to the north of the fleet building. There's a current fleet building there. And uh, I forgot to mention during that process when we were doing the RFP for this, the neighbors really wanted to keep that fleet building as part of the uh, development. And so the, the firehouse will be north of that, right next to the fire, uh, the police station and the L&I building. And then the uh, on and exit points of that will be on 11th Street and Reed Street. Cool, cool, good job. We used to go get water, use water <laughs> fountain. And then we- From the firehouse. The firehouse, we came from- um, Yeah, we're- and you'll hear some testimony also. There's going to be some public <laughs> comment from some neighbors there and still yeah. have some concerns about the project. Uh, so, you know, we still will continue to work through this uh, as we move on. There's a lot more work to do and a lot more engagement. So thank you. Okay, good job. If there's no other questions from members of the committee, I want to thank um, the panelists and we'll ask for the clerk to please call the next panel. Paula Brumblow Burns and Patrick Grossi testifying for Bill 210637. Just please identify yourself for the record and please begin your testimony. Good morning, members of the Rules Committee. I'm Paula Brumblow Burns, Director of Legislation of the Philadelphia City Planning Commission. I'm here to testify on Bill number 210637, which was introduced into City Council on June 24th, 2021 by Council Member Squilla. Bill number 210637 amends Title 14 of the Philadelphia Code entitled Zoning and Planning by amending certain provisions of Chapter 14-800 entitled Parking and Loading, which addresses parking requirements for uses on properties that are locally historically designated. This bill amends Zoning Bill number 190611 which lowered the minimum parking requirement for properties that are locally designated historic or that contribute to a local historic district. The proposed text of this bill removes the word addition from the regulations. This change clarifies that any new floor area located within the existing historic building will not trigger a minimum parking requirement. Any expansion outside of the historic building will continue to have a minimum parking requirement of 50% of the base zoning layer. Additionally, a provision to allow that parking to be provided off-site has also been proposed in the bill. The Philadelphia City Planning Commission considered Bill number 210637 at its meeting of July 15th, 2021 and recommended for approval. I'll be happy to answer any questions at this time. Thank you very much. Will the clerk call the next panel? Not panel, the next testifier. Patrick Grossi. Go 
ahead, Patrick, say your name for the record and you can begin. You're still on mute, Patrick. My apologies. <clears throat> okay. Uh, my name is Patrick Rossi. I'm here today representing the Preservation Alliance for Greater Philadelphia. Uh, good morning, Committee Chair Johnson, Vice Chair Squilla, members of the committee. The Preservation Alliance wishes to express its support for Bill Number 210637. The original provision which this bill amends was one of the handful of zoning changes to emerge from the Historic Preservation Task Force. It's a common sense provision which relieves or reduces parking requirements for the adaptive reuse of historic properties. The bill is exclusive to properties listed on the Philadelphia Register of Historic Places. So we're, we're, this only applies to a fairly small universe of buildings and potential projects citywide. It both encourages investment in historic properties and incentivizes listing on the Philadelphia Register, two goals the Alliance has readily pursued over its 25 years. So the current amendment before you simply brings the original bill closer to the spirit in which it was passed. Uh, and churches are particularly illustrative. If a historic church, for example, were being proposed for residential or commercial conversion, the introduction of a new floor plate, as you just heard, would probably trigger parking requirements, and that was not the intention. Um, the parking relief envisioned by the task force intended that projects like that would have no parking requirement, unless the building was being substantially added upon, in which case parking requirements do remain in place, but are reduced by roughly half. So bill number 210637 is a sensible tweak to an already popular bill, and we fully support its aims to better incentivize and promote the adaptive reuse of historic properties ease the path toward continued or renewed productive use. And I thank you for your consideration. Thank you very much. Uh, the chair recognizes the council, Mark Squilla, before we ask for questions and questions or comments from the committee. Councilman Squilla. Thank you, um, Councilmember Johnson. And I, and I want to thank um, the uh, Preservation Alliance, Paul Stanky and Patrick Rossi for their assistance in this, uh, realizing that any time we introduce uh, legislation, sometimes there's unintended consequences, or sometimes people look at uh, what we're doing and have their own take on what it means. So I think this clarifies it. And, and Patrick, maybe um, knowing that doing this also incentivizes a, a person to keep the historic structure instead of demoing it because the requirements would be if they demo it they would have to then include the restrictive parking requirements is that correct uh, i mean certainly this only applies <clears throat> to properties that are standing that are existing that are on the local register and if there's a permit that would otherwise trigger parking requirements right some sort of zoning change some sort of use change so yeah, if you were to demolish a property, somehow get permission through the Historical Commission to do that, then yes, you're not going to receive any uh, benefit for doing so. You're not going to get any parking relief by doing so. Right. And I think that's also important, as we see, uh, to try to preserve some of our historic structures. It's important to have these um, legislation in place. And, you know, the Historic Task Force came up with a bunch of options, still a lot more that we need to work on and, and introduce. Uh, but again, if we continue to go in this um, direction, we will start to see a preservation, uh, how important it is to keep the historic fabric of our city alive, why continue to build and develop, uh, but allow us to uh, be proud of our history and, and also to retain it. So, Patrick, thank you again for your advocacy, and uh, hopefully as we move forward, we'll have more and more uh, legislation to help us reach that call. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Councilman Squilla. Any questions or comments from members of the committee? Hearing none, I want to thank our panelists. Would a clerk please call the next panel? For bill number 210686, we have Paula Brumbler Burns. I am Paula Brumblow Burns, Director of Legislation for the Philadelphia City Planning Commission. I am here to testify on Bill Number 210686, 
which was introduced into City Council on September 17, 2021 by Council Member Squilla. The purpose of this bill is to allow for the construction of a new biomedical research building at Thomas Jefferson University to replace an existing above ground parking structure. Bill number 210686 remaps a parcel of land along 9th Street between Walnut and Locust Street from RMX3 residential mixed use to CMX4 commercial mixed use. This bill aligns with a Philadelphia 2035 citywide vision recommendation to encourage institutional development and expansion through policy and careful consideration of land resources. The Philadelphia City Planning Commission considered Bill number 210686 at its meeting of October 21st, 2021, and recommended approval. I'll be happy to answer any questions at this time. The clerk call the next testifier. Right. That is the only individual for this panel. Um, if there are questions, there are additional uh, representatives available for the project that would be able to answer anything. Um, okay. Would the clerk please recognize yeah. the clerk okay. recognize Councilor Mark Squilla. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, and I appreciate it that we have worked with um, uh, the community group here at uh, Washington Square West uh, on this proposal. Uh, Ron Patterson, representing Jefferson has been in conversations. Uh, we would um, like to, since we have the support from the community group, we wanted to hear this today, but we're still waiting for uh, uh, the map to be a, a attached and amended to this legislation. Jefferson has also agreed uh, to hold off. They did receive their EOP today, which is important. We want to make sure we attach that uh, to uh, this legislation. And Jefferson has agreed to hold this in committee until we have the signed EOP in place, and that'll probably be at the next rules hearing. Um, Mr. Patterson, do you have anything else to add um, as we move forward? Uh, good morning, Ronald Patterson, Claire Harrison Law Firm, 1835 Market Street, on behalf of Thomas Jefferson University. Uh, no, Councilman Squilla, that accurately reflects what has occurred. And as you mentioned, we had a series of three meetings over the summer with Wash West Civic Association. And we agreed and we'll have a side agreement with them concerning certain provisos about the building that's to be constructed, such as it will be commensurate with the, the, the adjacent uh, Lumley building in terms of height, 11 stories. Uh, we won't be seeking any bonuses under the uh, bump up of the uh, change of the zoning map. And of course, the EOP plan, which we're serious about. And you can imagine Jefferson being a large entity. We received it this morning and we have to you know, digest it and put it through the concurrence chain. So we're we're happy to, um, you know, proceed and, and uh, with the vote being held, and we'll we'll have it addressed by the next rules committee hearing. Thank also, you have, very much. Thank yeah, sorry. Also, thank you so much. I'm sorry. I just wanted to let you know we also also have Anthony Bracali uh, with Jefferson and Michael Hinchcliffe with Payette Architects. If there was any questions about the project or if you wanted to see renderings. Thank, thank you, um, uh, Mr. Patterson, and I um, appreciate your uh, continued work and effort and appreciate also your uh, ability to agree to hold this until we have the final uh, mapping and the EOP. Uh, and uh, we would like to hold this in committee, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, and then be able to amend it at the uh, next rules hearing in November. Um, thank you very much. And just want to give a shout out to Ron Patterson from South Philadelphia. And Thanks. Anthony and the Jefferson team, um, give a shout to Hugh Levy and the whole Jefferson team. I know y'all going for a little bit of post-traumatic stress as it relates to um, the recent gun violence that took place on Jefferson campus. So all the city council stand with the staff and employees at Jefferson Hospital. So, will the clerk please call the next panel? For bill number 210687, we have Paula Brumbleau Burns. I'm Paula Brumbleau Burns, Director of Legislation for the Philadelphia City Planning Commission. I'm here to testify on bill number 210687, which was introduced into City Council on September 17th, 2021, by Council Member Squilla. Bill number 210687. 0687 amends the Philadelphia zoning maps by changing the zoning designations of certain areas of land located within an area bounded by Trenton Avenue, Cambria Street, Tulip Street, and William Street. 
This is a proposed zoning map amendment from residential single family attached district RSA 5 to RSA 6 and would be the first zoning map designation of an RSA 6, which allows for smaller lots with the intent of preserving the two story block. The purpose of the proposed change is to facilitate redevelopment of vacant lots with 13 single family homes on individual lots. The development will be carried out pursuant to a redevelopment agreement with the redevelopment authority. The units will be developed and marketed as workforce housing. The Philadelphia City Planning Commission considered Bill Number 210687 at its meeting of October 21st, 2021, and recommended approval. I will be happy to answer any questions at this time. Thank you, Brett. Is there another testifier for this panel? Not for this panel. The chair would like to recognize Councilman Mark Squilla. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and it um, seems like I'm taking up all, all the bills here, but um, this is a, an important pro project that was also done through the uh, land bank. So this is one of the land bank proposals, the 5149 affordable uh, market rate pro projects, and um, uh, the remapping here enables to keep the block uh, as a um, low-dense um, two-story block to try to make it consistent and allow um, affordable development to be sold in in the community that desperately needs it so uh, you know we are also amending this bill to attach an EOP to that plan uh, this is uh, something that we're going to watch real closely to see if we could do this you know again in other areas of the district uh, we think it's really important to have affordability and also workforce housing where people who are now working and living in the city, maybe making, you know, $40,000, $50,000 are able to buy a home in the city. So it's so important. And so we want to make sure that our intent is being followed here and that this is something that we could do uh, with uh, private developers also. And, and want to thank the land bank for, um, you know, working through this process and guiding us as, as this takes place. So, um, I want to thank them. I know they're not here today, but they did do a lot of work uh, with the, this uh, particular development and uh, working with us. So thanks. Thank you, Councilman Squilla. Are there any questions or comments from members of the committee? Hearing none, will the clerk please call up the next bill and the next panel? For bill number 210549, we have Dennis Murphy and Terrence Foley. Good morning, Chairman Johnson and members of the Rules Committee. My name is Dennis Murphy. I'm the Senior Director of Corridor Improvements for the Commerce Department. I'm here to testify in support of Bill Number 210549, amending the Articles of Incorporation of the City Avenue Special Services District of Philadelphia and Lower Marion to extend the district's term of existence until December 31st of 2042. Since 1999, the City Avenue District has carried out capital improvements, public safety services, marketing, and developed partnerships and engaged stakeholders to bring vibrancy to this important area. The City Avenue District is critical in fostering cooperation along this important business corridor situated on the boundary between Philadelphia and Montgomery County. The proposed legislation will extend City Avenue's term as a municipal authority for an additional 20 years. As a second step in the reauthorization, City Avenue will return to City Council for approval for an updated plan and budget. This will occur, occur after City Avenue has shared that plan with all property owners and conduct, conducted a public hearing in accordance with the Pennsylvania law regarding municipal authorities. Business improvement districts are one of the best examples of collaboration between the city and our commercial areas. This worthwhile effort deserves our support. Thank you for your consideration and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Well, the next panel is pleased to enter your name for the record to begin your testimony. Good morning, Chairman Johnson. I am Terrence Foley, the president of the City Avenue Special Services District 
of Philadelphia and Lower Marion, better known as the City Ave District. Before starting, I would like to thank Councilman Jones for his support of the district over the years. It's been much appreciated. The City Ave District is a unique partnership between the City of Philadelphia and the Township of Lower Marion. It stretches from I-76 to 63rd Street along City Avenue. The district's objectives are to improve public safety, enhance the area's image, and attract and shape development. The district is a Pennsylvania Municipal Authority and is fully funded by assessments to commercial property owners within the district, which then funds the services provided. The City Ave District works with businesses, property owners, developers, and residents to shape the future of this important corridor. This work includes new zoning on both the Philadelphia and Lower Marine sides, allowing for much opportunity for new development. The district has secured over $14 million in funding for capital improvement projects, with over $13 million in streetscape and safety improvements having been completed over the last 10 years alone. There is an additional $3 million in improvements that are fully funded and will be constructed next year. The, the economic impact of this district's activities is substantial. Um, hopefully you received a copy of our uh, economic impact analysis that was completed by eConsult, but I'll summarize here. The capital improvements alone have generated almost $9 million of tax revenue for the City of Philadelphia. The resulting private sector investment in the Carter on the Philadelphia side has created an additional 400 new jobs. These jobs create additional direct and indirect annual expenditures of $54.6 million and employee compensation of $18.4 million each year. This increased economic activity generates approximately $800,000 in additional tax revenue for the City. The capital improvements and resulting private sector investments also generated increased property tax revenue for the city and the school district. The new construction and renovations within the district increased the assessed value of those properties by $100.5 million, generating an additional $1.41 million a year in property taxes. The district is also immensely proud of its contribution to public safety. The district employs an eight-person bike patrol, which has served to reduce crime by 55% over the last 20 years. The district also engages in community and networking opportunities for local businesses and restaurants. Over two decades of growth and achievements can be viewed in the timeline brochure that, again, I hope you received electronically. Um, so I look forward to seeing the continued growth and development of the district in the next 20 years and beyond. The district is seeking an extension of its Articles of Incorporation for another 20 years, approval for which is required from the Township of Lower Marion and the City of Philadelphia. Lower Marion has previously granted its approval. The district will be finalizing its 20-year plan for services and a budget, and in keeping with the State Municipal Authorities Act, will present this plan to property owners and conduct a public hearing. Once that is accomplished, we will return to Council for Council's approval. Thank you very much, and I'm available for any questions. <coughs> Excuse me. Thank you very much for your testimony. The chair recognizes Councilman Curtis Jones for remarks on his bill. Okay, we will move on. The chair recognizes the councilman, Councilwoman Captain Gilmore Richardson. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Chair. And first, I wanted to, to thank our colleague and my district council member, uh, Council Member Jones, for introducing uh, this legislation to extend the City Avenue Special Services District. Um, I was around uh, when the Special Services District first began uh, here in Winfield and uh, actually at that time lived right off of City Avenue. Uh, so have worked closely with the Bike Patrol uh, and uh, with a lot of you over the years. And Terrence Foley, I just want to thank you uh, for your steadfast dedication to our community and for ensuring that uh, we always have key initiatives in our area that continues to improve uh, not only our, our capital improvements, but public safety in our area. And the marketing, I think, has just been stellar, uh, particularly starting down at Presidential uh, Boulevard by 76. Uh, all the way up to 63rd Street. But you know I would get in trouble, Terrence, if I don't get this on the record, uh, particularly for my folks uh, in, in Winfield, and, and that would include uh, Winfield Heights, uh, and uh, Winfield, uh, Overbrook, and, and Overbrook Farms. So I had to get this on the record on how you all are monitoring uh, the types of businesses that are setting up along City Avenue 
um, particularly, uh, I would say, between the, the Winfield Heights area from the Balakinwa Shopping Center uh, on down to 63rd Street, and how we are ensuring that uh, the businesses that settle uh, on that corridor, particularly on the city of Philadelphia side, that it's fair and it's equitable. Uh, I just wanted to, to put that on the record. Thank you very much. We um, regularly uh, monitor what's happening in terms of new businesses. Uh, we want to support them and make sure they're successful. Uh, our bike patrol actually is one of my first lines of telling me there's activity in a building when it's vacant. And we immediately investigate and find out what's coming in there. Uh, we've not always been successful. As you know, uh, we have two uh, medical marijuana dispensaries, which we're not happy about, but that's, that's life. And uh, we are working to make sure that they are safe. Yes, and we so we work with the uh, the bike patrol folks, and they have been very very helpful uh, to us on the corridor, uh, particularly uh, in certain areas of the corridor where we may have vacant facilities. And I know that was the case uh, between Fifty uh, Second and I believe Brimmar for a very short time. Uh, at the old furniture store, but they have been very, very helpful. I just want to ensure that I put on the record, uh, because I will be supporting this bill for the members in the community, that I have uh, broached this topic to ensure that the businesses that are setting up on the city side of the, the City Avenue Special Services District, that it's fair and it's equitable. Because I know there is a thing in the community uh, where, you know, there's a belief that on the, the Lower Marion side, you know, they're getting the newer buildings, you know, i.e. the old KFC, the, the, the residential developments, and some of the other uh, zoning changes that have been made on the, the Lower Marion side, and that it's not the same on the city side. So I just wanted to put that on the record, uh, that we are for ensuring that any businesses uh, that set up on, on the City Avenue Special Services District uh, on the city side is, is both fair and equitable, and that we are thinking about out there for our overall vision uh, for City Avenue from 63rd Street down to 76 West. And then finally, Terrence, I just wanted to thank you uh, again for your steadfast support and for all you have done with us uh, over the last 20 years. And that was even back to the, the St. Joe's expansion uh, of the dormitories and uh, at the old supermarket site and everything in between. So I just want to thank you very, very much for your work. And I look forward to continuing to work with you. Uh, and Mr. Chair, for that reason, I will be supporting this legislation. And I thank my colleague, Councilmember Jones, uh, for introducing this. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Councilwoman. Any other questions or comments from members of the committee? Okay, thank you for your testimony. Hearing none, will the clerk please call up the next bill and the next panel? For bill number 210667, we have Paula Brumblow-Burns. I am Paula Brumblow-Burns, Director of Legislation for the C Philadelphia City Planning Commission. I'm here to testify on bill number 210667, which was introduced into City Council on September 27th, 2021 by Council Member Parker for Council President Clark. Bill number 210667 will amend the VDO 5th District overlay by removing the option for applicants to earn height and density bonuses using the mixed income housing bonus within the 5th Council District. The purpose of the mixed income housing bonus is to promote the production of deed-restricted affordable housing in new construction and increase contributions to the housing trust fund in exchange for greater height and density. This bill will apply to all properties within the overlay. The City Planning Commission at its meeting of October 21st, 2021, recommended bill number 210667 for approval with amendments. The commission recommends keeping the bonus in Center City and adjacent neighborhoods south of Spring Garden Street, but removing the option to pay a fee to the housing trust fund. Any bonus earned would require affordable units to be built on site. This is part of the fifth district in most need of affordable units and where we believe developers have the greatest amount of room in their pro formas to accommodate on-site affordable units. I'll be happy to answer any questions at this time. Any questions or comments from members of the committee? Hearing none, will the clerk please call the next bill and panel. 
for bill number 210668. We have Paula Brumbler Burns. Uh, we have Odessa Tate, Glinda Tate, and Tanetta Graham. And you can speak in the order in which your name was called. I'm Paula Brumbelow Burns, Director of Legislation for the Philadelphia City Planning Commission. I am here to testify on Bill Number 210668, which was introduced into City Council on September 27, 2021, by Council Member Parker for Council President Clark. This bill expands the Strawberry Mansion Neighborhood Conservation Overlay to cover the remaining two thirds of the neighborhood. The overlay applies design and zoning standards to all residential and resident residentially zoned properties. The NCO extension has positive goals, but is deficient in many of the requirements that the Commission's regulations set out for creating or expanding an NCO. These requirements ensure that staff has the correct materials to be able to apply the design standards of the NCO applications for building permits. The lack of materials will hinder, hinder staff's ability to review and approve applications and may result in noticeable delays. PCPC staff has begun conversations with the lead civic organizations and council staff in this part of the neighborhood, a process that is collaborative, deliberative, and unique to each neighborhood. The commission supports the intention of the overlay and would like staff to continue working with council and the civics to refine the overlay in this section of the neighborhood. The city planning commission at its meeting of October 21st, 2021, recommended bill number 210668 for approval with suggested amendments that will address creating more specific design language, revise boundaries to exclude blocks that are primarily non-residential or vacant, and have further considerations on height limits. I'll be happy to answer quest any questions at this time. Thank you very much. Well, next panelist, please state your name for the record and begin. Hello to the chairman and committee. My name is Odessa Tate, and I represent the village community of Strawberry Mansion and all in the family CDC. I'm in favor of the Strawberry Mansion overlay to be included into our boundaries within Strawberry Mansion. The identity of a community is rooted in the history and unique culture of that community. Community culture creates a sense of pride for a community and outliers of a community should not hold precedence or responsibility for community planning and not consider the community. Philadelphia itself is distinct and each neighborhood has their distinct characteristics that define the area. The overlay creates opportunities for smart development and enhancement tactics that preserve neighborhoods and not dismantle neighborhood culture with hodgepodge developments. The overlay allows for good practice in the following. One, collaboration. This adjoins community stakeholders and development. Two, more predictability, and that community members has better protection that supports a neighborhood's best interests. Three, appropriating and appreciating distinctive communities. Developments according to the overlay are attractive to communities because they intensify a strong sense of place. Communities are to maintain development in accordance to recognizability in terms of quality and infrastructure. Communities do not deserve to lose their identities with developments when there is already an established look and feel. This overlay forces new developments to adhere to a written standard and criteria that is consistent with a comprehensive plan. Layouts of properties often have serious impacts on neighboring and nearby properties. Importantly, fundamental fairness is upheld and that details of the overlay are clearly stated for regulatory standards and are not unconstitutionally vague. With this overlay, the expectation is to achieve higher standards and proficiency so that community culture and integrity are not compromised with new developments. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, the next panel, please state your name for the record and begin. Good morning, Chairman and the committee. Committee. My name is Glenda Tate, and I'm the president of All in the Family Group Associates, uh, CDC and RCO in the Strawberry Mansion section of North Philadelphia. And I am in favor of the overlay in my community because it gives community organizations and residents a chance to communicate with the planning commission, city council, and developers regarding our feelings as community residents about new developments 
added to the current housing stock. As community members, we have the right to say what we feel and what we would like to see within our communities because the decisions impact us greatly. The relations between developers and residents are important because it affects individuals and families residing in said community. The overlay provides regulations, boundaries, and standards that would provide more protection for neighborhoods who feel that they are under siege from new development to have more impact on what development should be or look like in their neighborhoods. To be clear, we do want um, to establish cohesive relationships with developers. It's not that our community does not want new development. It is the offensiveness of how the developments are propelled into uh, communities without our input from inception. Through lack of thought for a affordability and truly understanding the needs of the area. Developments impact parking, um, the flow of traffic and overcrowding, and most importantly, the cultural structure of the communities with overemphasized apartment living. The foundation of many communities have been built on family living. And with this, does the development align with the needs of the community or unethically go against them. With the overlay in place, developments are more likely to reflect neighborhood and the culture, the affordability and the characteristics of their area. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, the clerk, I'm sorry, will the next panel state their name for the record and begin? The next panelist is Tanetta Graham. If you are on, you may unmute yourself and begin your testimony. Tanetta, are you there? Okay, hearing none, any questions or comments from members of the committee? Hearing none, would a clerk please call the next call up the next bill, the next panel? For bill number two one zero seven four two, we have Paula Brumblow Burns and Dennis Boylan. Uh, Paula Brumblow Burns, Director of Legislation at the City Planning Commission. I am here to testify on bill number two one zero seven four two which was introduced into city council on September 23rd, 2021 by council member Clark Parker for council president Clark. The purpose of this bill and, a, and the accompanying bill 210741, which is being held, is to allow for the redevelopment of the existing surface parking lot with a multi-story office building. Bill number 210742 adjusts the maximum allowable height from 240 to 245 feet and places caveats on the applicability of CMX-5 commercial mixed use zoning provisions. These caveats would apply despite the status of zoning maps. The provisions of bill number 210742 would make it so that CMX-5 zoning applies only to an office building with retail or commercial services, on-site parking, no residential uses, and a payment of $2,500,000 $50 is made to the housing trust fund, regardless of whether a mixed income housing bonus is used. Planning Commission staff has no problem with the adjustment to the height limit for this parcel, but the other provisions of this bill, as written, apply very specific standards to only one parcel and require a payment for approval condition. Planning Commission staff feels that the proposed building does a good job of transitioning the scale of the JFK Boulevard to the lower scale of the Logan Square neighborhood to the north. A building of this scale can be developed in CMX-4 using zoning bonuses. Alternatively, a clean remapping to CMX-5 would make this bill unnecessary. 
The Philadelphia City Planning Commission considered Bill Number 210742 at its meeting of October 26, 2021, and recommended not for approval. I'll be happy to answer any questions at this time. Any questions or comments from members of the committee? I have a question. I just wanted to ask um, the reason why Planning Commission wasn't recommending the bill. We felt that they could do either a straight CMX-5 or CMX-4 with bonuses and meet the basic requirements of it, and they did not need an additional um, amendment to the Ben Franklin Parkway overlay that they could have just achieved most of this other than the five feet of height in their um, without a zoning overlay. Okay, thank you very much. Any questions or comments from members of the committee? Hearing none, will the clerk please call up the next bill and the next panel? We actually have one more individual to testify for this bill. It is Mr. Dennis Boylan for 210742. Okay, Mr. Dennis, please state uh, your name for the record to begin your testimony. And good morning, uh, Chairman Johnson. Dennis Boylan uh, for the Logan Square Neighborhood Association. Uh, I'm the president of LSNA, and this property that's subject to the amendment uh, falls within our neighborhood association boundaries. We were the coordinating RCO for this project. Uh, and we're a large neighborhood uh, uh, footprint. We go from Broad to the Schuylkill Market to Spring Garden. So a significant feature of our neighborhood is that it's bisected by the Benjamin Franklin Parkway. Our neighborhood takes very seriously the implied obligation to safeguard development in and around the parkway, specifically the height restrictions. The Parkway District is home to some of the city's most important hey, cultural... Hey, Dennis? Yes, sir. Hey, hey, Dennis? Yes? Yeah, just one second. Yeah, just one second. You're not coming through clear. Brett, do you hear a full testimony from him? Because I'm hearing glitches. I was having no issue hearing him, but um, okay, it might be unstable. Maybe at, maybe at where I'm located at. But go ahead, Dennis. We can okay. take, you can continue your testimony. And, I, and I've written a uh, written testimony, which I'll submit to the uh, the, the clerk afterwards. Uh, uh, the Parkway District is home to some of the city's most important cultural, educational, and civic institutions. And maintaining that unique quality is a civic duty of the government, the citizenry, and our neighborhood. LSNA does not believe that this development will adversely affect the Parkway District. And it is for that reason that LSNA supports the proposed amendment to the city code for this specific location. Our process in evaluating the project was informed by a number of factors. One, the development is just several, it's over two and a half blocks away from the Ben Franklin Parkway. The developer, the Parkway Corporation, worked in very good faith with LSNA and most importantly with the nearest neighbors. This was the Walden Walk condominiums to resolve any uh, issues that were of contention. The development will take what has been for decades a surface parking lot and put it into a more meaningful purpose. And in last but not least, the proposed occupant of the building is to be a single corporate entity uh, bringing prestige, jobs, and vitality to the city. Uh, these are some but not all of the reasons that LSNA supports this proposed amendment. And thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, for your testimony. Any other questions or comments from members of the committee? Hearing none, would a clerk please call up the next bill and the next panel? For bill number 210808, we have Paula from Blow Burns. I am Paula Brumblow Burns, Director of Legislation for the Philadelphia City Planning Commission. I'm here to testify on Bill Number 210808, which was introduced into City Council on October 7, 2021, by Council Member O'Neill. Bill Number 210808 amends the Philadelphia zoning maps by changing the zoning designations of certain areas of land located within an area bounded by Oxford, Shellmeyer, Rising Sun, Solly Avenues, the County Line. Borbeck, 
Hasbrook, and Hartel Avenues. The bill amends all CMX2 commercial mixed-use properties to CMX1 commercial mixed-use. This zoning change will prevent the redevelopment of these lots for mixed-use development projects that the community has deemed to be incompatible with the character of the Fox Chase neighborhood. The Central Northeast District Plan recommended keeping CMX2 zoning in this area to encourage mixed-use redevelopment of underutilized properties to strengthen the Fox Chase Business District and to encourage a strong walkable commercial corridor. The new CMX1 zoning prohibits restaurants and ground floor commercial spaces greater than 2,000 square feet. The Philadelphia City Planning Commission considered Bill Number 210808 at its meeting of October 26, 2021, and recommended not for approval. I'll be happy to answer any questions at this time. Thank you very much. Well, the chair recognizes Councilman O'Neill with remarks on sponsorship of his bill. Yes, Mr. Chair, thank you. Um, I understand the um, Planning Commission's opposition. I also understand uh, when the Planning Commission says the community uh, feels that the current zoning is not in compatible with the character of the neighborhood. Um, that's my responsibility, not the Planning Commission's, to make sure that uh, uh, the community is involved, community has input. And in this particular case, been working with the Planning Commission trying to find a solution because in the 2035 meetings there were walks in this particular neighborhood in Fox Chase with the Planning Commission and the board members of the Fox Chase Homeowners Association, the RCO. And what was sold to that, to that community, and it's been sold at different times in the past, is storefront commercial, pedestrian friendly, uh, it's a it's a potential little downtown for Fox Chase. It's the oldest area in my district. It has a huge uh, uh, train station right in in this area. The dead ends at Fox Chase, and there's a parking unimaginable parking problem that spills over. People come in from the suburbs because it's a cheaper monthly ticket. They park in front of people's houses. They park the lot fills up, and it's a large lot. And there's tremendous parking issues. So what the neighbors and the community felt they were getting when they agreed to the zoning is not what they got. Uh, there have been three proposals that have been approved at the Planning Commission just in the last uh, month or so. And the storefronts are not there. On one property, in the, and it's the biggest one, uh, the, the developer, and it's the same developer, they're basically building as many apartment units as they can, as high as they can, and as dense as they can. And you know what got left out of the equation? What the community bought, which was storefront commercial. Uh, the side streets, which are commercial, in particularly on this major, major one, uh, it was just ignored because the developer wouldn't have gotten four floors shoved in the 35-foot height which means the units are going to be about seven and a half feet inside the rooms. Uh, they would have had to do three stories. And if the side street had been used, that was the planning commission's discretion to use the side street. Uh, and it's an abomination. Uh, I've had two community meetings where people are just outraged. Uh, and the interpretation is not, does not go in favor of the community. It goes in favor of the developer to get the developer a buy right permit. And that's actually come out of conversations with the Planning Commission, that that's the goal. If we put these storefronts on the side, they wouldn't get their buy right zoning. They're not, the developer's not concerned about the storefronts, not about the commercial, which is what CMX, whether it's one or two, is all about. If there had been a couple stories above these units with residential, I wouldn't be here asking for CMX1, which is much more uh, community friendly when the people that are making the approvals, the Planning Commission, are more worried about what the developer can squeeze in than what the community feels is compatible with their neighborhood and their understanding of what 2035, the plan of 2035 was going to include. So I just ask my um, colleagues to support me on this. 
Uh, the last meeting a um, week and a half ago, uh, there was at least 100 people that stayed till about 11 o'clock after another meeting and gave a standing vote unanimously for this change. The three projects I mentioned, they're already permitted. Um, and um, the, uh, you know, th that, that's not going to change unless somebody appeals later and all that. But it's still in the, it's been approved. And I just asked, there's a lot of other properties like that. And um, uh, it's, it's one thing to see um, mistakes being made. And, uh, and, and, and actually, a community, it was double-crossed. Uh, but, but to sit back in my position representing this community and not do anything uh, when I know something wrong happened and something right can happen in the future, that's all I'm asking for. And I thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. I just had a question. So these are four story, a four story apartment building um, under 35 feet. Isn't the, the regular feet by right is 38 feet? In my district, there is a 35 foot limit gotcha. as an overlay. Okay. But that's a lot of that's a lot of density under 35 feet. Yes. If it had been a three story building with commercial on the bottom, there's there's room on the counting the, the side street commercial because it's a big, wide commercial street with nothing but commercial on it. Uh, there would probably be 13 storefronts plus three on the on the other street. We're just getting the three storefronts on the one. Everything else is 86 apartments squeezed in. They're 500 square feet and they're just packed in and it is an abomination. But, you know, the the horse seems to be out of the barn on this. Uh, it doesn't mean that we can continue uh, to have this happen. And I just ask you, uh, this is preventive for the future. It won't correct the past. Thank you. Thank you very much. Calvin. And it is it is commercial mixed use. And, and people understand that we have a restaurant in this that will be CMX1. People are not concerned about a restaurant. They're concerned sometimes about a restaurant, which is good that they have to meet with the community, tell them what they are, and uh, get the community support. Thank you. Um, just had a quick question for Paula. Yes. Yeah, just for clarity, Paula, so when there's projects um, that don't fall through on the original intent of what the Planning Commission has proposed, what's, what's the recourse? Does the project just move forward and then you have situations like this where a councilman has to come and try to provide corrective action or you circle back with the developer and say, hey, here's the, the policy as opposed to how you're supposed to develop to hold I'm, them accountable. Yeah, I'm going to say I have not seen this, the plan that was brought up as the example in question, so I'm going to apologize. But if the commercial wasn't being met or it didn't meet the spirit of the code and they feel that there was an error in the issuing of the review or the permit, we can always, or the council office, a neighbor, uh, another property owner always has the right to appeal the zoning permit based on an error of information not being provided adequately. So there is always that route it is always the best if it was an as of right permit. Um, we can always look more at the zoning code and kind of figure out, is it the 35 feet? Is it a three story issue? How do we kind of come up with bigger answers sometimes when we're in a rush to stop everything we don't always get to take as thoughtful thoughtful of a look as we'd like so we're always willing at the planning commission to go back and take a more thoughtful look instead of just a i understand the reaction time but we can also after this reaction time still look thoughtfully and see if there's other solutions that need to be made okay all right this thing thank, thank um, you Mr. very Chair, much yeah if Council i could just follow up um there has been plenty of time because there were two there were two projects initially. Um, the large one I mentioned with all the side street commercial possibility that was turned down. Uh, the uh, planning commission ha has reviewed it. Uh, they're sticking to their guns. 
And then across the street, we found out that the same developer that we knew about two projects has a smaller project, identical but smaller. And we asked that the side street be included in that while the review was being done, just in the last couple of weeks. We were told, no, it would prevent the developer from getting a buy right permit if we did that. And you know what? That is not consistent with what the Planning Commission should be doing, what their mission is. It should be balancing the community against the developer. And when something is CMX, I don't care if it's one or two, the community has already said, we'll take some residential above storefronts. Storefronts are the key to CMX one and two. We're getting the fewest storefronts possible so we can squeeze all these apartments in and get the fourth story in a very limited height situation. So I, I, I think this is really out of, out of line with uh, everything I have learned about the Planning Commission over the years. I think they're taking a totally different uh, left turn on the community and saying it's our way, more density or the highway, and saying that we, co we can appeal this. You know how hard it is for a community to, to appeal a zoning permit that was granted at the discretion of the planning commission because they have the discretion to use the side street or not. And there's no question that the side street should have been used, but it continued a week ago to be permitted the same way on a smaller project. So the developer, and as I'm quoting, could get a buy right project and not need a variance. And, I, and again, I just asked my, my colleagues for their support because uh, this is our only our only way of helping the community. Uh, you know, f filing a a zoning a challenge to a zoning permit to the zoning board is very very difficult, cumbersome. puts everything on the party with no money, the community, and uh, then has the city defending it because that's what happens. The city solicitor defends it, not the developer. They don't spend any money. The community has to spend the money and the odds are very long as to whether or not they're going to be able to uh, uh, succeed. Uh, and they shouldn't have to go through that uh, or run the risk of uh, what is oftentimes a loss. Right. So, so, Count, so Councilman O'Neill, are you saying <clears throat> the city solicitor, which is paid by our taxpayers, will be defending a developer against those very same taxpayers who are appealing to permit. Yeah, <laughs> yes. That's in, a, in essence what happens. Because when you, when you challenge now it's happening and appeal them. a permit. Me, Gerald B., can you put your phone, can you put your, your camera, whatever, on mute, please? Thank when, you, sir. When you challenge a, a zoning permit that was handed over to the developer as of right, you are challenging that the planning commission, in this case, it's the planning commission that recommends to LNI, that the planning commission erred. They did not properly interpret the zoning code. It's the city solicitor's job to defend the zoning board who relied on LNI and planning to do the right thing. Understood. That is exactly your description. Isn't what's in the code? It's what actually happens. Mm. Okay. All right. Thank you, uh, Councilman O'Neill. And uh, as always, I know you do your diligence on uh, representing your constituents and what you represent. Any other questions and comments from members of the committee? Hearing none, will the clerk please call up the next bill and the next panel? Our next bill is 210634, and we have Paula Brumblow Burns. Sorry. I was going to say, I thought we were done, and I forgot we had one, one more, so I apologize. I'm Paula Brumblow Burns, Director of Legislation for the City Planning Commission. I am here to testify on bill number 210634, which was introduced into City Council on June 24, 2021 by Council Member Gautier. Bill number 210634 
amends the master plan for the University of Pennsylvania bounded by areas of land located by Guardian Drive, East Service Drive, Civic Center Boulevard, 34th Street, 33rd Street, Walnut Street, the Schuylkill River, 34th Street, and University Avenue. The bill will allow for the expansion of the master plan at 3200 Walnut Street, which is previously mapped special purpose institutional in previous legislation. The expansion will include a proposed six-story building known as the Vagilos Laboratory for Energy Science and Technology, known as VLEST. The inclusion of the existing consortium building and square footage of updates of miscellaneous minor amendments recently approved administratively by Planning Commission staff. The proposal includes the addition of 43,150 square feet of total land area, 122,615 square feet of gross floor area, and 21,306 square feet of occupied area within the expanded boundaries of the University of Pennsylvania Master Plan. With these changes, the Master Plan District remains in compliance with development regulations specified in our City Code. The City Planning Commission considered Bill Number 210634 at its meeting of July 15, 2021 and recommended approval. I'll be happy to answer any questions at this time. Thank you very much. Uh, the Chair recognizes Councilman Jamie Gaudier for remarks on her bill. Um, I, I don't have remarks for this bill. I have remarks for the next bill. But thank you, Mr. Chair. <laughs> You're welcome. Any questions or comments from members of the committee on this bill? Hearing none, will the clerk please call up the next bill and the next panel? For 210778, we have Paula Brumblow Burns, Ada Smith, Pam Andrews. Um, and we have a couple more, but I will call them as we go. Good morning, members of the Rules Committee. I am Paula Brumblow Burns, Director of Legislation for the Philadelphia City Planning Commission. I am here to testify on Bill Number 210778, which was introduced into City Council on September 30th, 2021, by Council Member Gautier. Bill Number 210778 amends Title 14 of the Philadelphia Code by adding Section 14 532 entitled the AHP Affordable Housing Preservation Overlay District and making other related changes to amend the Philadelphia zoning maps by changing the zoning of land within an area bounded by 39th Street, Ludlow Street, 40th Street, and Market Street and to establish a temporary demolition moratorium. The bill has several components in an attempt to preserve affordable housing at this site. The development's current owners have notified the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development that they will not be renewing their expiring affordable housing contract and they plan on selling the site. They have also notified the current tenants that they must leave their homes by July 2022. The bill proposes to change the base zoning from CMX4 commercial mixed use to RMX3 residential mixed use. It also places use regulations that address affordability, create development standards to have a maximum FAR of 750%, implement a parking ratio of two parking spaces per 10 dwelling units, and to put a one-year demolition moratorium on any building at this site. The Philadelphia City Planning Commission considered Bill Number 210778 at its meeting of October 21st, 2021, and recommended the bill for approval. I'll be happy to answer any questions at this time. Next, we have Ada Smith. Um, Mr. Chair, um, would I be able to speak on the bill now? Mr. Chair, you are muted. Yes. Do you want to go now, Jamie, or after your panelists go? Um, I would like to go now, if possible. Okay. The chair okay. recognizes Councilwoman Jamie Gaudier. Okay. Um, good morning, everyone. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and all my colleagues on the Rules Committee for this opportunity to be recognized on Bill 210778. 
This legislation aims to protect both the 70 families who currently reside at the University City townhomes, as well as the future of affordability in this increasingly expensive part of West Philadelphia. The townhomes are a deeply affordable housing complex in the heart of University City, an amenity-rich neighborhood with easy access to transportation, high-quality schools, good jobs, and world-class healthcare institutions. The owner of this property opted out of their affordability contract with HUD, and they are actively seeking to maximize their profit for this mega site. The current residents of the townhomes have been notified that they may be displaced as soon as July 2022. Without immediate intervention, we will lose these very affordable homes forever. And for the second time in 50 years, it will come at the expense of working class Black Philadelphians. I'm sure that we are all familiar with the history of urban renewal and what it did to Black communities in this city. In the late 60s and early 70s, the city of Philadelphia raised the Black Bottom neighborhood to make way for a science and technology research campus, which today we now know as the University City Science Center. Uh -huh. Thousands of uh, Philadelphians, roughly 80% of whom were Black, were displaced as a result, not just from their homes, but from their community. The block where the townhomes are located was originally slated to be a part of that research campus, but neighbors and the University of Pennsylvania students banded together to fight. They demanded that sites be set aside for affordable housing so that people displaced by urban renewal had options to return and so that they would have access to housing in the neighborhood for generations to come. And eventually a commitment was made to West Philly residents that this site would be dedicated to low income housing. Now let's fast forward to today. 40 years after the University City townhomes first opened, our city and the third district has changed dramatically. Housing prices have tripled in this immediate area since then. In the last two decades alone, the black population east of 52nd Street has been cut in half. And the end of this demand is nowhere in sight. An estimated $5 billion has been spent on construction in University City in just the last 10 years. So all of this helps to explain why the University City townhomes are irreplaceable. Dozens of three bedroom apartments with rents that are 90% cheaper than what you can get on the open market, sitting on a piece of land that is valued today at 75 to $100 million. Oh Eradicating affordable housing on this site would be a grave injustice, not just for the families who live there now, not just for the thousands of Black Bottom residents who were removed from this land once before, but for the future of this place being somewhere where working class people can afford to live in an amenity rich neighborhood, one where jobs and transit and healthcare and other resources are all easily accessible to them. This is something that cannot be re replicated in today's housing market. The bill being considered today includes a one year demolition ban on the site. It would also make residential mandatory and add affordability requirements, which together provide a check against the perverse market forces at play in today's real estate market that encourage maximizing profit over the creation of inclusive neighborhoods. Last week, we were grateful to receive the support of the City Planning Commission for this bill. We appealed to the commission that they recognize the importance and the context of this site, and they took us up on that request. Now we come to this body with the same appeal, to not be swayed by the idea that this site should be sacrificed to Philadelphia's seemingly never-ending development boom. People matter. Places matter. Having equity and diversity in our communities matters. Today, let's do something different than what happened half a century ago in West Philly, and let's make sure there's justice for working class residents of our city in the months and years to come. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Council Member. Will the clerk please call the next panelist? We have Ada Smith next. Aida Smith, if you are on, please unmute yourself and begin your testimony. Aida Smith, my name is. Um, testimony. 
I've been here for about the 40 years since it's been built. Um, before the grounds were even finished, I was here. Over across the street where the Ralston house was, that was a vacant lot and everything. We've watched this neighborhood continue to be gentrified. And I don't understand how is it that right now you're, we're just finding out, and I'm quite sure city council, some members of city council knew what was going on. I'm glad she's taken up this bill. I'm in favor of it. I don't think that because we're in an area that's newly developed or all the development that's around it, that people want to be in this neighborhood because it is so close to everything. Everything right here is right here in this area and it tends to be a safe area. So I hope you're con reconsidering even letting them get away with this. They should not be able to get away with this. And I agree with your bill. Please pass her bill. Thank you That's very all much, I have. Thank you, Ms. Smith. Will the clerk call the next panelist? Next, we have Pam Andrews. Pam, state your name for the record and begin. Pam, are you there? Okay, we'll come back to Pam. Will the clerk call the next panelist? Next, we have Gerald Bowling. How you doing, Gerald? Good morning, Chair. Yes, yes. Trying to get a headset like you, Gerald. You trying to show everybody up? No, sir. No, sir. I just wanted to make sure I can hear clearly and everybody can hear me clearly. How's everyone doing? Uh, thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Rules Committee. Um, my name is Gerald Bullard. I'm a, a displaced uh, member of the Black Bottom Tribe. Uh, we we are a, we are a community that, that, uh, that has history over uh, hundreds of years. So 1850 uh, is is one of our points uh, that Dr. Palmer had brought up, uh, where we were recognized, and that's way before Penn, Drexel, or, or any other entity uh, came into our neighborhood uh, to destroy it. Um, I uh, I want to support the Councilwoman's bill. And I also want to talk about white privilege, because this is all this is what is this is about. Okay, this, our neighborhood has always been a transfer for every every community in the city, and they knew that, and they and they were trying to buy our homes and put us out for many of years. They bulldozed our houses on 36th Street, 38th Street, to get us out of there to build the University uh, Science Center and also University City uh, Schools. So they got us out of there. Uh, through that tactic, and then now they're trying these tactics of, of now not giving us the apartheid agreement that they agreed to in the, in the late seventies, saying that we wasn't stabilized as a community, which was which was far from the truth. We're a stabilized community, which everyone else around us, far as Manchu, uh, 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 up the way, Fifty Second Street, they're not they're not dealing with the black bottom immensely. So. Um, I'm here to say, like, uh, the Black Bottom is, is, is actually tired of these folks uh, thinking that uh, they're going to keep pushing us around and pushing us over on, on our land. This is our land. This is, I understand that the city and the, and the, and the, and the uh, other, uh, you know, uh, big wigs of the institutions came and bought this land, but it's also stolen land. So this land was stolen from us, the people of the Black Bottom. And we, and we, want, to, we want this land returned. And this is part of the land that we want return because we should have ownership in our own community. We shouldn't have to be begging for nobody to give us anything like we like I heard on this whole situation. You know, please don't do this to us. Please don't come in our neighborhood and do this to us. Please. No, we need to have our own ownership. And this and this is where people fail to realize uh, uh, what we need to, to clean up the community. Everybody's talking about all this violence going on. Guess what? White privilege is the cause of it because they're moving people out 
displacing them in neighborhoods that they having gang war with. So what do you think is going to happen? What do you think all this violence is coming from? Nobody knows, right? So I just now include you in to what to what it is to stop the violence. Stop stop overbuilding. Give people a chance to live. There's been five billion dollars. Uh, the, the councilwoman said that went through the uh, uh, University of Penn. Not one contractor was black. Not they didn't even want to hire black people on there. And we got I got testimony to prove that that they told it they, they do not want black people on their job sites. You understand? So 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 this is bigger than anything that we can never imagine. You know, we talk we talking about people trying to sell land that's not theirs. People who who are at, who, who 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 ostracize the black bottom out of their own neighborhood. We don't have an RCO. We don't even have a voice in our own community. And, and what, the, what what is that? This is the black bottom. It's not University City. It's the black bottom, and that's what it's always going to be. And I and I want the city uh, council to recognize that, like y'all did before. Y'all recognized us a, us as a, a historical community. So we need to be we need to be recognized also all around the board with ownership, with loans and grants to help us out build our community and build our people. We want to stop the violence just like you do. Give us a chance. If you if you, if, if y'all give us a chance to come sit down and talk to us, we can get together and we can stop this violence. We're not going to stop it the way you're going. You have to talk to us. You have to communicate with us and give us a chance. We we we're in a neighborhood we we don't have no ownership at, and we and we we were the we're the dominant people there, no ownership at all. That doesn't sound right. So let's let uh, I pray I pray that we can all get together to change this, for real. I really do, and um, I uh, thank y'all for letting me talk get this get this out. I wanted to say some more things, but I'm not going to say it. Uh, but I hope that um. I can send y'all all what I'm um, what I'm thinking in my heart on my um my uh my um, PowerPoint. I can send it all to y'all so y'all can get adjusted what I mean. You know, um, you want to stop this violence? I do too. I've seen all y'all out there trying to do it. The way to stop the violence is come to us, family. We we got to be a family. You can't you can't exclude us from from the help because we're the experts with the help. We're the ones that been in jail. We're the ones that been floating around in these streets. Give us a chance to help y'all understand where we're coming from so we can stop this. And remember, white privilege is the cause of it all. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, may I ask a question? Are we going in order? Is there other people slated to speak? Because yes. I wanted to make a comment. There are other people slated to speak. And just give me one second. I'll have to give you an opportunity to make your comment. Brett, can you call the next panelist? Yes, um, we have Timothy Boyle. Go ahead. Good morning, everybody. Uh, Timothy Boyle, founding principal of Science Leadership Academy Middle School, uh, and also a proud principal of Ms. Smith's Rankits. Uh, I'm here today uh, in support of Bill 210778. Wanted to provide uh, chairperson uh, and other council members some context um, of the bill. Um, University City townhomes represent um, 70 of the 154 um, private HUD contracted homes in our catchment area. Uh, when I say catchment, I mean the uh, geographic boundaries uh, of my school uh, and the Powell School as well. Um, the vacancy rate at both of these uh, housing sites is uh, less than 10%. So these are homes that folks want to live in um, that are filled um, at or near capacity uh, all of the time. Uh, as was mentioned earlier, uh, we'll be potentially losing these 70 units July 8th, 2020. Uh, the 84 units at Center Post Village, which is located at 55 North 40th Street, that contract is also up in 2024. Um, so mm -hmm. the decisions that we make today um, could also lead us uh, down a path one way or the other decisions we'll have to be making again in the near future. Um, SLAMS has 22 students uh, that got an eviction notice. Uh, Powell School has 34 students that got an eviction notice. Uh, the 22 students represent 6% of my school. Um, it also represents 48% of all the students who attend my school who live in the neighborhood. Um, Powell and SLAMS are um, 
a bit odd is that we both have robust um, populations that come from outside the neighborhood. Uh, we were talking about most of the folks who live near our schools, who attend our schools, live at this site. Um, the 34 students at Powell represent 15% of their total population. Um, so a significant driver of um, folks who walk to school uh, and populate our school. And this is, these numbers have been born out over the last six years uh, that I've been the principal um, of SLAM. For folks who, you know, know the history, uh, it's been nice to hear uh, from folks testifying. Previously, um, this site that we're talking about is four blocks away from where University City High School, Drew Elementary, and the Walnut Center were located. Uh, it's a 14-acre site that now hosts 6.5 million square feet of retail, residential, clinical, office, and laboratory space. Um, there are very few places in the city um, where so many affordable homes are next to so much uh, economic opportunity, uh, cultural opportunity, and educational opportunity. Um, my hope of this bill is in the near term, uh, there could be justice for the families uh, that are located, but also that we could preserve uh, affordable housing right next to um, some of the greatest opportunities that this city has to offer. Um, that is all my testimony, but any comments or, or questions, anything I could add, uh, I'd like to. Thank you very much for your testimony. Ms. Smith, are you want to make a comment or you want to ask a question? I wanted to make a comment because, uh, well, yeah, a comment. And it was riding on the back of Mr. Gerald and Mr. Boyle. And um, as I said, I've been here for a long time. And you notice when people start looking in and you see outsiders and how they want to be here. And it's always where black people get pushed out. And the reason why we get pushed out is because they raise the taxes, the real estate taxes so high that you can't afford to stay in your own community anymore. So what, you're ne what you need to do is to make sure, if it can't be saved at least, make sure it's, it's, it's a mixed income neighborhood. I mean, it's gonna be people that work in the area but can't afford to live in the area. That doesn't make sense to me. You know, um, they it's things that's being done constantly to push black people away. And to me, it seems like it's going to be to the outskirts of, of, of the city of Philadelphia. And that's Upper Darby, uh, uh, Yaden and all of that. And black people won't be able to afford to come back into the city. And I noticed this going on around this city. In places where I, I grew up in North Philly. And you hearing stuff about what's going on now. What they're trying to take. Oh, I'm sorry. Can you see me? Yes, I see you. Okay. <clears throat> that they're trying to do now. In North Philly. And around the city. And I don't think it's fair. So her bill, it really needs to be. Uh, her Take a serious look at it. And to stop a lot of what's happening around this city. And if it wasn't for uh, developers, there wouldn't be homeless people. Kind of speculation and real estate. If you took that out of the equation, I can't get this to go bigger again. Hello? Hello? Yeah, I'm here. We hear you. <laughs> I'm gone. I don't see where I'm at. We can so see I don't you. know if you can see me. But um, real estate you. speculation, that's what's literally driving a bunch of stuff around this country. They're in the richest country in the world, and you have homeless people. And it's because of real estate speculation. So the things that need to be done is to make sure that Philly is and its residents, especially black residents, black and brown, need to be uh, uh, a priority. Especially since we do most of the work in this daggone city and can't find decent housing. And this is one thing that I like about my community is that my grandkids are safe. 
Hello? Yes, we hear you. I'm done now. Thank you for letting me speak. I'm trying to get back to where... <laughs> You're welcome, Ms. Smith. Thank you for your testimony. Will the clerk please call the next uh, panelist to testify? Pam Andrews. Pam, let's state your name for the record and please begin. Good, good morning. My name is Pam Andrews. Um, I am the chair of West Saunders one second, Pam. You're very, very faint. Can't hear you. Can you hear me? Okay, hold on a second. How about now? Uh, just a little bit. Can you turn your volume up a little bit more? We're having some technical issues today. Ms. Andrews, you're still there? Hello, can you hear me now? Um, you're faint, but if can All other right. members of the committee hear? All right. I'm Go ahead, gonna, Pam. Okay, great. Good morning. My name is Pam Andrews. I am the chair of West Pouton Saunders Park RCO. And I am here um, to testify in support of the mixed income neighborhood and introduced by Councilwoman Gautier um, this morning, which the West Palton community feels is long overdue. I have been a resident of the area for over 30 years now, and I have seen many families. Back in 95, when my husband and I moved into the area, um, people could afford um, to rent a house, a one-bedroom apartment for $500 um, a month. Now, as the chair of West Pouton Saunders Park um, Zoning Committee, when developers come in um, to request variances, um, the average cost of an apartment that they want to build is the monthly rental is 14 to $1,500 a month, and townhouses are built and sold for $300,000. Um, the West Philly, West Pouton community feels very strongly in terms of supporting this bill. We feel it is overdue, and it is probably one of the first big steps that needs to be done to protect affordable housing in this area. Like I said, when, when, when my husband and I moved here, um, there were families. Now there are very few. On my block, I would say right now there's probably only three long-term residents um, who have been able to stay here. Either the price of, of real estate has gone up, taxes have gone up, um, and we are just <coughs> overrun um, with student housing. So I'm here. Thank you for taking the opportunity to hear me this morning. And um, we are very excited um, to support this bill to um, assure that affordable housing is maintained in this area. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm going to ask Councilman Jamie Gardier, any additional remarks, Jamie, before I start acknowledging other members of the committee? No, no thank you, Mr. Chair. All right, you're welcome. Council, Chair recognizes Councilman David O. Thank you very much, Chair. I, I just wanted to respond to Miss, uh, is it Ida Smith? I think so. One of the things Aida. Of, Aida, I'm sorry. Miss Ida, I just wanted to um, completely agree with what you're saying in terms of the taxes. And, and one of the things I just want people to understand is you have to watch your assessment you know, the assessed value. Um, so, for example, we have cases in Philadelphia where it's the office OPA, Office of Property Assessment. If you pretty much understand that your house is worth about $100,000, it's not good news when OPA comes out and says your house is worth $350,000 because it isn't 
Right. But you're going to have to pay the taxes. And that should be one of the first things because it happens in your neighborhood. It doesn't happen all over the city. It happens in these gentrifying neighborhoods. And a lot of it is illegal. It is, it is generated by a 10-year tax abatement that occurred somewhere in the neighborhood. And by law, they cannot increase your value, but they do. And we did, council did an audit of the assessment methodology. That means the way they do these assessments and it was found to be below industry standard. That means it is below an acceptable standard of assessment. Um, so please be aware that, you know, unfortunately some people, they get this uh, assessment and they don't understand you're going to pay the taxes and it's the first okay. sign that there is something wrong. I did a bill and, I, and I've reintroduced the bill to freeze these, um, these taxes based on these illegal, in my opinion, and I say so, if it is below industry standard, it's an illegal assessment and it's an illegal tax and people should not pay these taxes. So please be alert and thank you very much for your testimony. Thank, thank you. you, Chairman. You're welcome. Thank you, Councilman O. Uh, Chair, I want to acknowledge you for a brief remark. Yes, I just wanted to ask uh, Councilman O, uh, are you in support of that, support of uh, 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 Councilwoman Gautier's bill? I don't know the le I I'm supporting it. I'm not voting against it. I don't know the at the end of the day the legality of it. That's something that the administration, the planning uh, commission. So I'm voting for the bill. That's your bottom line question. However, I do think that elsewhere in the city and in other parts of Philadelphia, it, it, to me the most the most direct thing that's happening is people are being targeted for improper, illegal, overly high assessments that is leading to overly high taxes that leads to sheriff sales and other things where their property, they're not even getting the money that's assessed on. So, yeah, I do support the bill, but I will say that ultimately I think we have to straighten out um, these assessments and the corresponding taxes that are driving people out of this city, depending on what neighborhood they live on, under the threat of sheriff sale. Well, my, my other question was, uh, do you think that we need to make a committee for affordable housing and have the community members in the housing where there's gentrification at uh, be on that and, and have have power not not just not just being on there as a as a as a as a, as a sitting stone but actually have power to stop the developers just coming in and doing things of that nature i think that will be a better a better uh way to, to to solve some of these things that's going on especially uh the violence that's happening in the communities because because actually when you when you actually take somebody and displace them you put them in another place like they took the whole pass young out and put it somewhere else and then they, they took another place and put it somewhere else they took bloomberg and put it somewhere else and now everybody's running around talking about well why all this violence happening why are people shooting 900 bullets this is the reason why because they're not going to lay down to nobody else then when they're going into a neighborhood where they're not liked where they're not wanted and and then guess what the people there are fighting back and they got to fight back too so so my question is so should we have a committee that's, that's citywide uh, that has all the communities in concern with, with, with all these developers and then it's a board that these developers have to come to in order for them to be able to develop in the ways that they want to develop, also keeping affordable housing alive because we need that. You know what I mean? So, so uh, we gave we gave the uh, contract or the, the developers ten year abatement. So why don't we go ahead and give the people that that's on affordable housing that ten year abatement and put them in some housing? You know what I mean? Uh, that's that's mixed, as you say. So let's put them in let's put them in that new uh, building that they building on um, uh, 38th and Palton. Uh, 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 that's going up now. That the uh, the, uh, the, uh, the high rise that Penn just built. I mean Drexel just built with pennies. You know, on a dollar, that's another that's another uh, place of the black bottom. So let's 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 put people in there too, because uh, they they have to share, right? Let's share. Yeah. So I'll, I'll take your I'll take your statement as a suggestion and recommendation. What I don't want to do is start having a private conversation with you, because we're in the middle of the, of a hearing. I'm happy to talk with you, and and I've done things publicly as well. You can you can contact me anytime. Come visit. I'm right in 319. You can stop by today. 
I'm here. But but let me respect the chair and um and, and this hearing. Okay, that thank you very much. But thank you for your your comments and suggestions. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much. Any other questions and comments from members of the committee? Hearing none, we will take a brief pause so that our technical crew can set up for those who register for public comment.
hear the testimony of those who have signed up for public comment. The clerk will call your name on once call. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Will the, will the clerk please call the first witness? Commenting for Bill 210778, we have Andre Del Uh, good afternoon, Chairperson. Please, we all know you, but please state your name for the record and begin. How are you doing, Andre? I'm doing good, Council Member. Appreciate it. Um, good afternoon, Chairperson Johnson and members of the Committee on Rules. My name is Andre Del Valle. I'm the Director of Government Affairs for the Pennsylvania Apartment Association. I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to testify today on bill number 210778 introduced by uh, council members of the TA. The Pennsylvania Apartment Association is a statewide association representing property managers and landlords uh, across Pennsylvania. Here in Philadelphia, we represent 98 property management companies and over 156,000 units. Now, the Pennsylvania Apartment Association truly believes in the spirit of cross-collaboration, especially when it comes to legislation impacting the housing industry. Locally, we have worked closely with PHDC, assisting in emergency rental assistance fund rollouts, hosting briefings for both landlords and tenants, and nav navigating the program, while also troubleshooting challenges with the program. We have cross-collaborated with the Office of Emergency Management and relocation efforts for flood victims follow following Hurricane Ida, and have worked closely with Councilmember Brooks and Community Legal Services on the newly implemented Renters Access Act. Currently, we're working with the Office of Immigrant Affairs, Department of Human Services, and Department of Homeland Security on resettlement efforts for our Afghan brothers and sisters who are coming to seek refuge here in Philadelphia. I highlight this cross-collaboration because legislation like the one before us today desperately needs to have an open dialogue among all stakeholders and its elected officials. I can assure you that no landlord or property owner wants to add to Philadelphia's continuously rising homelessness rate or displacement rate. And on the contrary, landlords across the city have been working to avoid housing instability as we all continue to navigate the challenges brought on by the COVID-19 pandemic. I know uh, BIA will be testifying today and I don't want to speak for them or their membership, but I know firsthand how they proactively work with district members on the front end of the legislative process on variances, rezoning, et cetera, for their projects. What raises concerns about this particular piece of legislation is that it would rezone and would establish a demolition ban for one parcel known as the University City Townhomes. The total number of units we're discussing today at University City Townhomes is 70. That's less than the number of units that were scrapped in a, a proposal a few weeks ago and just a few blocks away where residents demanded parking over units, reducing the project from 174 affordable units down to 100. Unfortunately, this will not be the first or last landlord that will sell their property here. Um, this is actually the first of uh, many uh, within our membership here in the city of Philadelphia due to the rising costs of maintaining buildings, rising costs associated with every new regulation passed, and as well as dealing with the continued ramifications from the COVID-19 pandemic. The question before this committee today is not whether this legislation should pass or not, but rather, will this committee set the precedent and support future rezoning of a single parcel of land, which is privately owned without the support of property owners? The Pennsylvania Apartment Association has and will continue to stress the need for private public partnerships and cross collaborating to address the challenges our city faces. We welcome an opportunity to bring all stakeholders together, residents, as well as elected officials to sit and discuss viable options for this parcel, which addresses residents and community needs while not punishing an owner for wanting to sell their personal property. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. For the current, please call the next panelist. Commenting for Bill 210778, we have Mo Rushdie. Mo Rushdie. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mo Rushdie, and I serve as treasurer of the Building Industry Association of Philadelphia, as well as co-chair of Supportable Housing and Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committees, and member of the Real Estate Alliance. I want to thank Chairman Johnson and the rest of the committee for allowing me to provide testimony today on Bill Number 210778. We recognize that there is an urgent need in Philadelphia for affordable housing options, 
for a great many people and have been seeking to collaboratively craft policies with councils that help all residents in the city share in its prosperity. Bill number 210778 moves the city in the wrong direction. However, the BIA has historically respected district council members' efforts to rezone parts of their districts. But this bill's reach is unlike anything we have seen before. It's a rezoning that targets a single privately owned parcel without the owner's support and proposes a demolition moratorium on this side as well. The legislation will create a da dangerous precedent and have a chilling effect on the real estate development community. Although it sometimes doesn't want to acknowledge it, City Hall needs private developers to build what government cannot, producing the housing that current and new residents want and generate the jobs and tax revenue that are so badly needed. To build housing and a strong economy, developers need just one thing from City Hall, and that is certainty. We can figure out what type of project to build and where and when to build it, as long as we can control a sufficient number of variables to make projections work. But bill number 210778 would make it possible for council to rezone any parcel whenever it wants and halt demolition before a new project is announced. Suddenly, Philadelphia has a whole lot more uncertainty than anywhere else in the country, because this would not happen anywhere else. Why then build here? Even more frustrating is that this dramatic legislation is apparently proposed in the name of affordable housing, but the city continues to squander its best opportunities to generate significant quantities of affordable housing for its residents. In the third councilmanic district, there are 647 publicly owned parcels that could be used to house those in need. I repeat, 647 properties. In the BIA's affordable housing blueprint, we argue that the city's housing crisis can be resolved if City Hall simply increases its capacity to dispose public land quickly to qualified applicants. You have the land, the development community knows how to build what you want. And we supported the Neighborhood Preservation Initiative to reach lower AMRs and the deeper affordability that Councilwoman Gautier just spoke about. What are we waiting for? Didn't we know about this project over a year ago? So to Mrs. Aida Smith and Mr. Gerard Bowling, Please listen to me. I hear you and I feel you. We can build for sale affordable single family homes for you at very low pricing made possible by city land with the neighborhood preservation initiative that we supported. I am going on record. Talk to Councilwoman Gautier and see all of the public land that's available and talk to her about the 51% of these homes being affordable, making, making mixed income neighborhoods possible, as Ms. Smith mentioned. Further. Council decided to decrease the amount of money that developers will pay into the Housing Trust Fund by lowering the bonuses available. And now bill number 210667 seeks to eliminate the bonuses altogether in one council manic district. These bonuses were a key component of overcoming Philadelphia's high construction costs in neighborhoods that would not otherwise see investment. Eliminating these bonuses in 10% of the city and potentially imposing inclusionary zoning mandates on 20% is sending a clear signal to the real estate community to look elsewhere. No one has to build in Philadelphia, and soon maybe no one will. The BIA is sincere in its desire to be part of the solution. We believe in solutions that work for all. Unfortunately, Bill number 210778 is a dramatic example of City Hall actions that punish the development community for long-standing shortfalls in housing policy that we have demonstrated support for affordable housing, provided effective alternatives, and are willing partners. Please let us take a step back and work together. Please, thank you for your consideration. Mr. Chair, you are muted. Thank you. Will the clerk please call the next panelist? For bill number 210778, we have Joe Ritchie. Good afternoon. My name is Joe Ritchie, and I'm here today on behalf of the Greater Philadelphia Chapter of NAOP, where I serve as the president. NAOP is a 501c6 organization that represents the commercial real estate development community in Philadelphia and is also a member of the Philadelphia Real Estate Alliance. Thank you to Chairman Johnson and the rest of the committee for permitting us to provide testimony on bill number 210778. 
The membership of NAP understands that affordable housing is an important issue in the city that collectively the public and business community need to address with comprehensive and holistic solutions. However, if approved, Bill 210778 would set a dangerous precedent with the unintended consequence. The legislation effectively spot zones the block, uh, 3900 block of Market Street, without the owner's consent, prohibiting any alterations to the site and rendering it unsellable. The University City townhomes were developed under an agreement that called for development of the affordable housing residences and obligating the owner to maintain the Section 8 housing and affordability for 40 years. The owner agreed to and met this obligation and now at the end of the term faces legislation which changes the nature of the agreement. This, uh, this, would, this precedent would put up for consideration whether private landowners have the right to manage and sell their property within the confines of the rule of law. We urge the committee to consider the fine balance between economic growth and affordable housing and to think deeply about the far-reaching implications of spot zoning without approval of the landowner. As an industry, the real estate community relies on the predictability of land use and cannot support targeted legislation that undermines the confidence in the system. This use of spot zoning as a tool to preserve affordable housing is only necessary because Philadelphia currently lacks an efficient and functioning mechanism to holistically address affordable housing development. The city is being, being forced to choose between supporting affordable housing and supporting a once-in-a-generation growth industry that could be one of the cornerstones of Philadelphia's future economy. We should be able to choose both. We support fully BIA's proposed plan to use land in Philadelphia's land bank for affordable housing, and I will refer to the previous speaker's comments on the number of parcels uh, available in this district alone through that mechanism. Instead of introducing legislation that puts the interest of one group against the other, we would all be better served with new legislation to solve the larger problem. Zoning is not a tool for micro-issue micro resolution, of which affordable housing is just one example. Zoning is meant to guide the path of development and growth in a thoughtful and balanced way. It is meant to have certainty and should only be altered or modified with a thorough, deliberate, and robust process involving all parties, uh, including the current owner of the land. The questions that we as a city are faced with today deserve legislation that sincerely attempts to construct working mechanisms to holistically address the issues of affordable housing. NAOP sincerely wants to be part of the solution. We hope to work together. Thank you very much for your consideration. Thank you for your testimony. Would the clerk please call the next panelist? Issa Rashid. Good afternoon, panel. Uh, my name is Issa Shaheed, representing the Labor District Council. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. On behalf of more than 6,000 members of the Labor District Council, I am here to support in support of the plans to redevelop 3900 Market Street, a project that would create thousands of new, good paying jobs for our people at a time when they are most needed. <clears throat> in support of this project, we are asking council members to postpone consideration of bill number 210778, legislation that could have a chilling effect on the new investment and opportunities in the city of Philadelphia. Such a move would be a devastating blow to our members and their families. The legislation purport to address concerns over affordable housing, something that is a growing consideration in cities and communities across the nation. As a union that represents and is committed to the interests of working class people, it is a concern we share. But support for redevelopment of the university city townhome site does not have to come at a cost of eliminating affordable housing and leaving these residents without safe, affordable housing options. Here's why. Redevelopment of 3900 Market Street has the potential to be a billion dollar project because of the size and location. 
this site is likely to become a new life science research center, a project that could total $1 billion in development. A project of that size will create as many as 6,500 construction jobs over the next several years, as well as 3,800 permanent jobs. These are jobs that pay families sustainable wages. And the redevelopment is, a, is, is also expected to generate more than $25 million a year in new state and city tax revenue. <clears throat> It is a project that could start quickly once the land is sold. The site is already zoned CMX4, which means that the property is already zoned for redevelopment. If we, as a city, are serious about lifting people out of poverty with good jobs, this is an opportunity that we must not squander. We share concerns about ensuring residents are treated fairly, and we applaud Council Member Gaudier for her commitment to pro to provide affordable housing to her community. As always, she is thoughtful and committed to doing the right thing, but it is clear that the owners of 3900 Market Street are willing to work with her in this effort. They have said publicly they have no interest in merely selling the grounds and leaving the residents stranded. A commitment that we will join Council Member Gaudier in ensuring they live, live up to. <clears throat> they are already working to make sure that no one loses their Section 8 benefit for the future. They are meeting residents individually to help them find and secure affordable housing. They are working with a not-for-profit developer to transfer the Section 8 rental authorities from University City Townhomes to other locations in West Philly which will provide long-term rental assistance and additional 113 families. <clears throat> and they have pledged to cover all moving and relocation costs for these residents. In response, many residents have expressed interest in relocating immediately, mm -hmm. even though University City Township uh, townhomes will not close until July, till next July. <clears throat> the owners are willing to work with Council Member Gaudier to create new affordable housing options near the site, ensuring that residents will be treated fairly and with dignity. And that's the way it should be. So it's not one or the other. Redevelopment of this site won't leave the residents sh stranded. And for that, I applaud Council Member Gaudier for leading the fight to make sure that that the redevelopment doesn't threaten affordable housing in West Philadelphia. But Philadelphia needs to capitalize on the opportunities presented by this project. We have the potential to create more than 10,000 jobs once the sale of this property is completed. That means putting more people to work, which is critically important in the fight against poverty in our city. We can do both, and we should. Let's work together to make it happen. I urge council to support the redevelopment of this site, and with all differences and respect to our friend, Council Member Gaudier, reject bill number 210778. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Have a good one. Thank you. Will the clerk please call the next panelist? For 210778, we have Brett Altman. Good morning. Good morning, Chairperson Johnson, members of the committee, and staff. Thank you for the opportunity to testify this morning regarding City Council Bill number 210778. This legislation is before you today for consideration. In addition to these remarks, I am submitting supplemental written testimony for the record. My name is Brett Altman. I am a principal of IBID Limited Partnership, the owner of the property at 3900 Market Street, the University City Townhome. This proposed bill, if enacted, would specifically impact the property. I am here today to make a simple and straightforward request of this committee. Please give us more time to work to select a buyer with a development plan that has a low-income housing component. 
I, along with my partners, have received a number of offers for this property within the last 30 days. These are not final offers. We are committed to working with these interested parties, Council Member Gautier, and the administration to develop a plan for the future of this property that will include affordable housing at the current site. I believe that with all these parties working together, we can develop additional affordable housing in West Philadelphia that will benefit more people than currently serve on the site. But we simply need more time to work with the parties that are interested in purchasing and developing the site. I have been in communication with Council Member Gaultier since December of 2019 regarding the future of our property, but we only formally solicited offers in August, and as a result, those offers were only submitted recently. We believe that we can develop a plan that will allow for affordable housing on site. If you vote this bill out of committee today, it will automatically and drastically devalue the land. My fear is that such an action will cause these potential buyers to not pursue the purchase any further. That will cost all interested parties valuable time. As I stated to Council Member Gautier last week in a meeting, we are committed to working towards a positive resolution that work, can work for everyone. Thank you for your time. Next, we have Barry Grossbach. Yes, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to, um, to speak with the uh, committee. Uh, I represent uh, the Spruce Hill Community Association, and I'm not authorized to speak on the bill before you, but rather on the history of the site, which we were intimately involved in. Uh, during the Rizzo administration, his housing director, John Gallery, approached Spruce Hill with the proposition of um, Section 8 housing uh, financed by HUD at one of two possible sites. Uh, they suggested the former PGH site where the hospital came down on the Civic Center Boulevard or 40th and Market as a possibility. We consider the Civic Center site a non-go. Uh, we felt that it would be warehousing people with no amenities, uh, no stores or anything else, uh, and they would just be isolated off on an island. We looked at 40th and Market. We felt that that was a legitimate site to consider public housing and we decided that we would uh, conduct community meetings to get a sense of how people felt about the, the proposed project. Uh, needless to say, whenever you talked about subsidized housing, uh, there was pushback within the neighborhood, uh, but there was also a lot of support. We had some interesting meetings with over 100 residents attending, and ultimately Spruce Hill came down in favor of the development of the site. One of the key factors in, in our decision was the fact that Friday Associates, headed by Don and Arlene Matskin, who were known architects and residents of Palton Village, um, were the proposed developers for the site. So we felt that whatever was put up there would be of a sufficient quality that the residents would benefit and the neighborhood would as well. So it was an interesting uh, exper experiment for us. Um, it was a neighborhood that came together in support of subsidized housing at that particular site, and I just felt that the committee should have some history in terms of how all of this came about. Uh, it's been a, a project that has been sustained for 40 years. Um, we didn't know how it would turn out, but um, it has been a uh, beneficial uh, experiment and, and a successful housing development as far as we're concerned. And I thank the committee for the opportunity to just give a bit of a history lesson as a former uh, history professor at Community College of Philadelphia. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Brett, are there any more panelists on this particular bill? Uh, for 210-778, there are no other uh, speakers for public comment. The chair recognizes Councilman Allen Dow. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I've been listening to the testimony, and uh, while I'm not on the committee, I just wanted to explore the idea that Mo Rushdie brought up, because I read about the op-ed in the Inquirer this week. I don't know if he's still on this call or not, but I had, did have some questions for him if he is on the call, but if he's not, we can do it offline. I think his idea on the affordable housing um, is something we should really explore. I think it's creative, and I think it could help solve the situation. And I just want to mention that 
I think there's 69 or 70 people involved. If we could figure out a way to get them affordable housing that they could actually own and build wealth it would be a great solution to this. And also get get the jobs. We want to try to come out of this with both a win win for both. So that's my comments for today. Thank you, Councilman. I'm available. Oh. Um, Mo, I have a question for you. Can you just explain simply if it's an option for the 69 or 70 people that live at 39th and Market? to engage in your idea about the affordable housing and they could actually wind up owning a home versus renting one. Absolutely, Councilman. Um, again, uh, if we're talking about 70 homes, um, if we're talking about the bill, the 190606 bill that has passed unanimously in January of 2020, then we're talking about um, close to 139 lots of which 51% would represent that 70 homes of where we can build for sale affordable housing um, on public land. And we would be without, um, without using any MPI money, you would have cost of housing somewhere between $850 to $1,000 per month. But if MPI money is used to buy down the AMI, then we can provide housing as low as 50% and 40% and 60% AMI, which is basically deep affordable housing um, with for 70 homes um, with close to about four and a half million dollars of MPI money. And that would get you 70 homes with backyards, single family home, um, new construction, nine foot ceilings, um, 1,250 square feet, three bedroom, two bathroom homes. We have done this model before on the first and the second workforce housing developments under, under the leadership of Council President Clark uh, on RFPs that were in 2016 and 2018. Um, and we continue as a BIA in our, in our blueprint to have models that work, they have been proven, and using MPI, much, many, or all of these 70 residents um, could have been housed easily on public land, on single-family home, new construction homes. So just to clarify, Mo, what you're saying is the 70 or so people that live at 39th and Market could wind up owning a home at a similar payment versus renting one. Absolutely. Yes. Okay. You know, I remember from my uh, days in the business, the old expression, when you rent, it's a house, but when you own, it's a home. So that's a great idea. I hope we can take advantage of it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Any other questions or comments for this particular panel? Next, I'm going to ask the clerk to please call the next panel. For commenting on bill number 21667 and 21068, we first have Sherry Brown. Good morning, everyone. My name is Sherry Brown, and I'm a longtime resident of Strawberry Mansion. I am in support of bill numbers 210667 and 210668 to exempt, to exempt City Council President Clark, 5th District, from the mixed income housing zoning bonus and the expansion of the Strawberry Mansion Neighborhood Conservative, um, Conservation Overlay. Um, I remember one developer whose attorney repeatedly reminded us during a community meeting that they met the required um, criteria by law to receive two bonuses, wherein they would get additional an additional 34 units, of which only 10 of the total of 94 units were designated affordable. They may be well versed with the law, but where is their moral compass when they have two rental buildings across the, buildings across the street from each other at 29th and Diamond Street, and they plan on building an additional 94 rental units on 29th Street, 30 plus rental units on Diamond Street, while demolishing what was once most precious blood Roman Catholic Church, rectory, and parochial school, which hope opened in 1908, um, that sits next to that, replacing that with a beer garden. We are talking about possibly adding a total of 400 plus renters in a one block area, um, which greatly increases the density and limited parking that currently exists. 
a group of community organizations and stakeholders in Strawberry Mansion formed a coalition to create the Strawberry Mansion Neighborhood Conservation Overlay, which enforces a series of neighborhood specific building regulations on new construction to retain the historic character of the neighborhood, which some of these houses were built more than 100 years ago. Currently, we have over 200 PHA rental units in Strawberry Mansion. We are not against development, but we demand respect from these developers for what we need, and that is affordable home ownership to build and sustain Strawberry Mansion. I urge President Council, Council President Clark to connect us with the organization that specializes in web-based technology that uses videos and surveys to teach and engage the residents of Strawberry Mansion about our neighborhood's land use issues in order to plan for equality and preservation. Knowledge is power, and we are willing to work with you all, but we will not continue to be disrespected by these developers coming in and um, taking over and destroying our um, community. Um, knowledge is power, as I said, and buy right is not right, and bonuses must go. Thank you, and have a blessed day. Thank you. Would the clerk please call the next um, person for public comment? For Bill 210-667 and 210-668, we have Melvin B. Sharp, Jr. Mm -hmm. Malcolm, are you there? Oh. Hi, Councilman. Uh, Melvin just hung up really quick, so we're going to try to get him called back on the line. Okay. Well, the clerk call the next person for public comment, and then we'll get Melvin after. Perfect. Uh, next, for bill number 20667-668, we have Benita Cummings. Good day, Chairman Johnson and the Roof Committee. Can you hear me? Yes, you can hear you. Oh, great. Philadelphia is not New York City. Philadelphia is not a city of mostly high-rise buildings and neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. The movement by developers assisted by bonus legislation mm -hmm. to make Philadelphia a city of high-rise mm -hmm. apartment buildings has unleashed mm -hmm. the worst conduct in developers. Mm -hmm. And today, Philadelphia neighborhoods are experiencing very aggressive tactics and attacks from those developers. They are harassing elders and inducing fear in longtime residents who have managed, cleaned, and fenced at their expense many of the lots. Many residents and neighborhoods boarded up open vacant buildings and painted them. In the name of development, developers have decimated the rare and unique mural of Martin Luther King at Ridge and Diamond and blocked or trapped, leaving only his arm as well as trapping the mural arts image of John Coltrane behind the new development at 2848 West Diamond Street, which, by the way, is for sale for $1 million plus dollars. Bonuses continue to perpetuate one-sided wealth. Developers pay a price and become millionaires, billionaires, or even trillionaires, according to how many times they can flip your district. The idea of affordable rental housing created by bonuses that only create in a development project of, for example, 95 units at 10% bonus, that is only 9 of 10 moderate income units, that can be a very slow process to the much stated housing needs and a lot of harassment to communities for so little. Bill numbers 210667 and 210668 are necessary at this time to further expand neighborhood boundaries and preserve and protect the inclusion, health, welfare, and safety of sensitive and vulnerable communities. These bills help restore some balance and give time for amended legislation to correct the harm and neighborhoods to comprehensively plan. In perspective, African Americans have not been sitting around twirling their thumbs as the unique designs and housing in their communities Strawberry Mansion in North Central met with decay. Residents in those neighborhoods asked questions of preservation, inquired about how to get access to and repair for the King properties, etc. We thought we had a plan called light elimination, 
with engaged neighborhood ambassadors. However, the breakdown of that neighborhood discussion and planning was when the name was changed from Blight Elimination to Neighborhood Transformation Initiative, NTI. Put NTI in the single-handed change in 2012 of the Philadelphia Code and, and Philadelphia Zoning Code, and we now have a very destructive weapon. Constituents do not always want to be on the defense from developers who act as conduits representing so-called wealthy or powerful investors. We would like to get a win-win. So there has to be more transparency. Communities need more inclusion in the legislative process, meaning times, hearings are held, where they are held, et cetera. I would like to get a better understanding of what area we are talking about, South of Spring Garden Amendments Bill number 210667. We look forward to your support of Bill numbers 210667 and 210668. And I do thank you for allowing me to have a voice today. Thank you very much. Will the clerk please call the next individual for public comment? For bill number 210638, we have Sue Patron. Hello. Thank you, Rules Committee Chair, Co-Chair, and Council Members. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity to testify. My name is Susan Patron, and I am a past president of Past Young Square Civic Association and Columbus Square Advisory Council. I am testifying today to urge you to put a pause button on Bill 210638 on Altara's proposed 155 apartments in retail on our municipal complex land. Uh, the heart of my, while density is driving, density is driving this proposal, this proposed plan, the heart of my testimony is safety. According to Altara's own traffic study, they claim the entire complex will generate 856, quote, new daily trips. That translates into cars distributed among Reed, Morton, and 12th Streets. Absent are any calculations related to deliveries. Rideshare, Uber, Lyft, food delivery services, GoPuff, Instacart, Caviar, Postmates, Grubhub, not counting UPS, FedEx, and Amazon Prime trucks. Our rough calculations add 90 more vehicle trucks with delivery, delivery cars to this development and also um, which uh, will impact on 12th Street. Now, this proposed 12th Street... Uh, where these, some of these, many of these cars and trucks will go, have, will have ingress and egress on the 12th Street sidewalk. On 1014, on that block, by the way, our council person was gracious enough to come and visit the site today and talk, and our uh, civic president was with us also. On 1014-21, at the intersection of 12th and Morton, from 8.25 a.m. to 9 a.m., I did a head count of 480 pedestrians, meaning children and families, using the sidewalks where all of the above are proposed. Is it, a, is it safer to plan for more cars and trucks on sidewalks? Would any of us here want one, approximately 1,000 more cars and trucks in our neighborhood? Would any of us want to put more vehicles across the street from a multi-generational park playground? Is it feasible with the scale of this proposed development, it's feasible to align with Vision Zero and keeping our children safe? How much mitigation do we need? Could Altera offer a plan that makes us safe, even safer than before this proposed development? I'd like to say I appreciate the work my council person and my civic association has put into this. Uh, COVID has presented a lot of issues, but again, the pro if we safety is primary. That's the primary focus. So this this proposed project needs a much deeper look and a pause button here in the, in the rules committee. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Would a clerk please call the next? Person for public comment. For bill number 210638, it's Sarah Anton. Hi, um, can you hear me? Hello? Yes, we can yes, hear you. Hear. Okay, great, sorry. Um, 
Good afternoon. My name is Sarah Anton. I'm a board member and the immediate past president of Passion Square Civic Association. Um, we're the resident, we're the registered community organization for the area addressed in Bill 210638 uh, regarding the zoning and master plan changes to 1100 Warden Street, what is commonly understood as the municipal complex. Um, since 2018, PSCA has worked with uh, Council Member Squilla, the Department of Public Property, and the Philadelphia Industrial Development Corporation, PIDC, to gather community feedback for the proposed sale of 1100 Wharton. In November of 2018, PIDC attended our general meeting to present about the process for recruiting and review reviewing proposals for the site and to review the community engagement process that led to the development of the 2035 City Master Plan, which includes a vision for this area of our neighborhood. Following this meeting, we opened up an online form and provided instructions to encourage neighbors to submit feedback. We also started a dedicated mailing list for updates about the process of reviewing development proposals. We collected a wide range of neighbor comments with visions for this area and submitted these to PIDC to be included as an addendum to the RFP. In addition, concern about public school capacity issues were raised at this point and a special neighborhood committee or neighbor committee was formed to work with the school district to explore the possibility of uses for this site to assist in addressing this issue. At this point, PIDC proceeded with development um, proposal recruitment and review. As this process continued, Council Member Squilla arranged for the unique opportunity for a representative from our group to be part of the selection committee in an effort to maximize transparency and community input. This later expanded to a team from PSCA, myself as president um, of the group, as well as our vice president, zoning chair, and planning committee chair. Uh, this team was able, able to participate in develop, developer interviews for the two finalist proposals that were submitted in response to the city's request for proposals. In June 2019, with the permission of PIDC, we were able to share key facts about each of these proposals with neighbors. We distributed flyers door to door to hundreds of homes within the blocks of the site, sent emails to thousands more neighbors, provided an online hub for comments, and provided an in-person update to about 50 neighbors at our general meeting that month. We invited neighbors to share their opinions about proposals directly with the mayor, Councilman Squilla, and uh, our board. While more than half the neighbors responding to this call for comments supported a mixed-use proposal on this site as submitted, we clearly heard that there is not a consensus in the neighborhood about the right amounts of amount of density and parking in this area. Almost universally, however, we heard concern about preserving green space, a desire to preserve the fleet management building, and to mitigating the downsides of gentrification um, and the opportunity for development of this site to add units that would be affordable to senior, small business owners, civil servants, educators, retail workers, and tradespeople that have historically called Pass Young Square their home. This feedback was provided to the applicants and ultimately the applicant most responsible to these concerns, Altera Property, was invited to present a full proposal to the neighborhood in December of 2019. The revised project featured additional residential permit parking, support for affordable housing, and reduced density. Again, we distributed information door to door in blocks surrounding the property about this meeting, posted the development proposal online, encouraged direct feedback to our council member via dedicated email address, and provided reminders in our monthly newsletter and at our monthly general meetings to the community on how to make their voices heard con concerning this project. After a long hiatus due to the pandemic, Council Member Squilla arranged uh, for a meeting on July 20th, 2021 to present the updated project, taking into account all neighbor comments collected online and provided uh, during a community meeting in December 2019, um, uh, and provide via various channels and individual meetings with constituents from December 2019 through June 2021. The master plan legislation before you is responsive to community feedback and represents a compromise of, wide range, of a wide range of concerns and aspirations for this site. Well, as an organization, PSCA is in non-opposition to the master plan changes before you today. Uh, there are many details to be worked out before ap approval of the sale of this parcel and before our board would be comfortable being in non-opposition to the specific development project with Altera Properties. Neighbors can continue to have concerns about the selection of a commercial tenant, the scope and details of green space, pedestrian safety and other traffic concerns, 
and concerns that the, the design of the new building will be generic and out of concern, out of character with the neighborhood. We believe that the unique and extensive level of community engagement in this process has allowed for continuing improvement to the proposed project and perhaps the addition of some components like affordable housing that might otherwise have never been included in the site. It is our hope that neighbors can continue to work with Council Member Squilla and the development team to address outstanding issues and concerns and find solutions to make this project a contributing and appropriate addition to this vibrant part of the city. Thank you. Thank you very much. The clerk call on anyone else who's here for public comment. Councilman Squilla, you would like to be acknowledged? Yes, thank you, uh, Council Member. And I just want to thank the people who are testifying, Sue and, and Sarah, uh, and their input and, and really hard work during this process. It's been a long time. And yes, we have more work to do. We will continue working uh, with the community and uh, appreciate their their efforts and um, looking forward to uh, having future meetings as this moves forward. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, clerk, clerk, please call anyone else who has a public comment. Mr. Chair, there is no one else uh, in attendance for public comment. Is anyone else whose name has not been called? That would like to testify. Hearing none, at this time I'm going to ask for all panelists and those who have signed up for public comment to please disconnect as we conclude this hearing and go into a public meeting. This officially concludes the public hearing of the committee. We will now go into a public meeting to consider the actions to be taken on the bills before this committee today. Will the clerk please call the roll so we can convene the public meeting? Council Member Mark Squilla. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and colleagues present. Council Member Cindy Bass. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and colleagues. I am present as well. Council Member David O. Good afternoon. I am present. Council Member Brian O'Neill. Present. Council Member Catherine Gilmore Richardson. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and colleagues. I'm present. And that is it, Mr. Chair. For the we have, a, now we have a quorum and we will now go on to our public meeting. The chair recognizes Councilman Mark Schooler for a motion on bill number 210638. You're on mute right now, Councilman Schooler. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I was reading to myself. It's cool. <laughs> I move the bill number 210638 be reported from this committee with a favorable recommendation and further move that the rules of council be suspended as to permit the first reading of this bill at the next session of council. Can I get a second, second. from someone? Second. The chair notes for the record that Councilwoman Cindy Bass seconds the motion. It has been moved and properly seconded that bill number 210638 be reported of this committee with a favorable recommendation and further move that the rules of council be suspended to permit first reading of this bill at the second at the next session of council. All those in favor of the motion will signify by saying aye. Aye. Uh, aye. aye. Those opposed, the ayes have it, and the motion carries. The chair recognizes Councilman Squilla for a motion on bill number 210637. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move the bill number 210637 be reported from this committee with a favorable recommendation and further move that the rules of council be suspended as to permit the first reading of this bill at the next session of council. Second. The chair notes for the record that Councilman David O. seconds the motion. 
It has been moved and properly seconded that Bill Number Two One Zero Six Two Seven be reported from this committee with a favorable recommendation, and further moved that the rules of council be suspended to permit first reading of this bill at the next session of council. All those in favor of the motion will signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed. The ayes have it, and the motion carries. The chair recognizes Council Mark Schooler for motion on Bill Number Two One Zero Six Eight Six. Six eight seven. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me back up for a second. The chair recognizes Councilman Mark Scholar for a motion on Bill Number Two One Zero Six Eight Seven. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move the bill number 210687 be reported from this committee with a favorable recommendation and further move that the rules of council be suspended as to permit the first reading of this bill at the next session of council. Second. Second. The chair notes for the record that Councilwoman Cindy Bass seconded the motion. It has been moved and properly seconded that bill number 210687 be reported from this committee with a favorable recommendation and further move that the rules of council be suspended to permit first reading of this bill at the next session of council. All those in favor will signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it and the motion carries. The chair recognizes Council Mark Scola for a motion on bill number 210549. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move the bill number 210549 be reported from this committee with a favorable recommendation and further move that the rules of council be suspended as to permit the first reading of this bill at the next session of council. Second. The chair notes for the record that Councilwoman Catherine Gilmore Richardson seconds the motion. It has been moved and properly seconded that bill number 210. 549 be reported from this committee with a favorable recommendation and further move that the rules of council be suspended to permit first reading of this bill at the next session of council. All those in favor, all those in favor of the motion will signify by saying aye, aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it and the motion carries. The chair recognizes Council Mark Schooler for a motion on the amendment to bill number 210667. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm, I offer an amendment to Bill Number 210667. A copy of the amendment has been circulated to all members of the committee, and I move that the amendment to Bill Number 210667 be approved. Second. The chair notes for the record that Councilwoman Cindy Bass seconds the motion. It has been moved and properly seconded that the amendment to Bill Number 210667 be approved. All those in favor of the motion will signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it, and the motion carries. The chair recognizes Councilman Mark Squilla for a motion on the bill number 210667 as amended. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move the bill number 210667 as amended be reported from this committee with a favorable recommendation and further move that the rules of council be suspended as to permit the first reading at, of this bill at the next session of council. Second. The chair notes for the record. The Councilman Brian O'Neill seconds the motion. It has been moved and properly seconded that Bill Number Two One Zero Six Six Seven, as amended, be reported from this committee with the favorable recommendation and further move that the rules of council be suspended to to permit first reading of the of this bill at the next session of council. All those in favor of the motion will signify by saying aye 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 aye. aye. Opposed. The aye ha ayes have it, and the motion carries. The chair recognizes Councilman Mark Schooler for a motion on Bill Number Two One Zero Six Six Eight. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move the Bill Number Two One Zero Six Six Eight be reported from this committee with a favorable recommendation, and further move that the rules of council be suspended as to permit the first reading of this bill at the next session of council. Second. The chair notes for the record that Councilman Cindy Bass seconds the notion. Motion. <laughs> It has been moved and properly seconded that Bill Number Two One Zero Six Six Eight be reported from this committee with a favorable recommendation and further move that the rules of council be suspended to permit first reading of this bill at the next session of council. All those in favor of the motion will signify by saying aye, 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 aye. Opposed? The ayes have it, and the motion carries. The chair recognizes Councilman Mark Squiller for a motion on 
the amendment to Bill Number Two One Zero Seven Four Two. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I offer an amendment to Bill Number Two One Zero Zero Two One Zero Seven Four Two. A copy of the amendment has been circulated to all members of the committee. I move that the amendment to this bill, number 210742, be approved. Second. The chair notes for the record that Councilman David O seconds the motion and has been moving property seconded that the amendment to bill number 210742 be approved. All those in favor of the motion will signify by saying aye. 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 The ayes have it, and the motion is carried. Give me one second. Chair recognizes Councilman Mark Squiller for a motion on the bill to number 210742 as amended. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move the bill number 210742 as amended be reported from this committee with a favorable recommendation and further move that the rules of council be suspended as to permit the first reading of this bill at the next session of council. Second. The chair notes for the record that Councilman Brian O'Neill seconds the motion. It has been moved and properly seconded that Bill Number Two One Zero Seven Four Two as amended be reported from this committee with a favorable recommendation and further move that the rules of council be suspended to permit first reading of this bill at the next session of council. All those in favor of the motion will signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed. The ayes have it, and the motion carries. The chair recognizes the council Mark Schooler for a motion on a motion on the amendment. To bill number 210808. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I offer an amendment to bill number 210808. A copy of the amendment has been circulated to all members of the committee. I move for the, that the amendment of bill number 210808 be approved. Second. The chair notes for the record that Councilman Cindy Bass seconds the motion and has been moved and properly seconded that the amendment to bill number 210. 808 be approved. All those in favor of the motion will signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, the ayes have it. And the motion car the motion carries an amendment to bill number 210808 has been approved. The chair recognizes council member Mark Squiller for a motion. Can everybody mute their phone or your computer, your screen, if you're not speaking. The chair recognizes the council member Mark Squiller for a motion on bill number 210808 as amended. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move the bill number 210808 as amended be reported from this committee with a favorable recommendation and further move that the rules of council be suspended as to permit the first reading of this bill at the next session of council. Second. The chair notes for the record that Councilman Brian O'Neill Seconds the motion and has been moved and properly seconded that Bill Number Two One Zero Eight Zero Eight as amended be reported from this committee with the favorable recommendation and further move that the rules of council be suspended to permit first reading of this bill at the next session of council. All those in favor of the motion will signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed. The ayes have it and the motion carries. The chair recognizes the council member Mark Squiller for a motion. On the amendment to bill number 210634. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I offer an amendment to bill number 210634. A copy of the amendment has been circulated to all members of the committee. I move that the amendment to bill number 210634 be approved. Second. The chair notes to the record that Councilman Cindy Bass seconds the motion. It has been moving properly seconded that the amendment to bill number 210634. Be approved. All those in favor of the motion will signify by saying aye, aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. The motion carries. An amendment to bill number 210634 has been approved. The chair recognizes the council member Mark Squiller for a motion on bill number 210634 as amended. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move to Bill Number 210634 as amended be reported from this committee with a favorable recommendation and further move to the rules of council be suspended as permit the first reading of this bill at the next session of council. Second. The chair notes for the record that Councilman Brian O'Neill seconds the motion. It has been moved and properly seconded that Bill Number 210634 as amended be reported from this committee with a favorable recommendation and further move that the rules of council be suspended to permit first reading of this bill at the next session of council. All those in favor of the motion will signify by saying aye, aye. 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 Those opposed, the ayes have it, and the motion carries. The chair recognizes the council member Mark Squiller for a motion on, on the amendment to bill number 210778. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I offer an amendment to bill number 210778. A copy of the amendment has been circulated to all members of the committee. I move that the amendment of the bill number 210778 be approved. Second. Second. The chair notes for the record that Councilman Brian O'Neill seconds the motion. It has been moved and properly seconded that the amendment to bill number 210778 be approved. All those in favor of the motion will signify by saying aye, aye. 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 Opposed, the ayes have it, and the motion carries, and the amendment to bill number 210778 has been approved. The chair recognizes Councilmember Mark Squiller for a motion on bill number 210778 as amended. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move the bill number 210778 as amended be reported from this committee with a favorable recommendation and further move that the rules of council be suspended. I submit the first reading of this bill at the next session of council. Second. The chair notes for the record that the count that council member Cindy Bass seconds the motion. It has been moved and properly seconded that bill number two one zero seven seven eight as amended be reported from this committee with a favorable recommendation and further move that the rules of council be suspended to permit first reading of this bill at the next session of council. All those in favor of the motion will signify by saying aye, aye. 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 Those opposed? The ayes have it, and the motion carries. Um, Brett, for the record, are we holding bill number 210741? Yes, the two bills being held at this time are bills number 210741 and 210686. Okay, so for the record, bill 210741 is being held. And Brett, the next bill is also, what's the second one you, you mentioned? 210686. And for the record, Bill 210686 are also being held at the request of their sponsors. This concludes the rules hearing. I want to thank all my colleagues for their um, dedication and participation on this hearing. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Great job. Thank you, Brett. Have a great day. Thank you.